uh, and we want um, to be able to balance our assessment system so that we're not over testing, but it is actually a, uh, in alignment. And so we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this house is not done yet. Uh, we still have uh, some work ahead of us and we'll be talking about that work. Um, just to review briefly how DCAs are put together. Uh, first, we look at the standards, the pacing guide, scope and sequence. Uh, we develop items. Uh, we have to develop these items uh, for both subject areas, both ELA and math, uh, through four grades, three through eight, and then high school courses as well. And so there's uh, a lot of items that, uh, that goes into this. Uh, and then we put these items out for review. We have a more structured, systematic way of doing it this year uh, than we did last year. Last year was a COVID year. It was a little difficult to do that. Uh, but we have found uh, some success this year in reviewing our items. We deliver the test, and then we use the data uh, to drive some of our decisions, um, either at the district level or in PLCs. So here's uh, third grade ELA. Uh, the chart on the left is the blueprint from the State Department uh, for the Kansas Assessment Program. So you can see third grade ELA test summary and the proportion of the third grade test uh, when it comes to writing, reading, um, and the two different uh, reading liter literary text and informational text. Um, and from that, uh, we assess the standards that go into those domains uh, so that we can have more targeted uh, remediation and plans for students. It's at that standard level. Uh, one of the things that I'll draw your attention to is in key ideas and details, uh, the RL 3.3 standard. You see at the beginning of the year we did actually assess this in October and we assessed it again in February. And we see that those percentages went up. We see the same thing with RL 3.1, um, but this is, this is something that should take place. Uh, some teaching took place and students should uh, have a better understanding of that. We do see RL 3.5, that there was a slight decrease there. Uh, but this information can be used uh, by teachers. So we have, we have seen how district common assessments are used at, at the district level in previous presentations. And this is how DCAs can be used more at the teacher level uh, and dive into those sta specific standards uh, to help us with that goal of increasing uh, our third grade ELA scores um, on the CAP assessment. On the next slide, we have the same thing with math. Here's eighth grade math. Uh, and this is the percent of students uh, in that classification of mastery. Again, on the left, you see the table produced by the state. And then you see on the right uh, how students are doing on those particular standards and how they fall into those domains. Last year, we saw uh, in functions down at the bottom, 8F3, 8F5, those function standards were a really strong predictor of how our students scored on the state assessment. Uh, this year, those uh, scores are much higher than they were last year. Last year, we had a lot of pacing issues. Um, we weren't able to get to specific standards uh, at that point in the year. Uh, it was difficult, uh, just timing-wise. Uh, and so this year, um, it, it would appear that we should have a rebound in our eighth grade assessment scores based on uh, that functions, those function standards. Is there, is there a question? Feel free to chime in, Shannon. I, I do have a question. Okay. Brief. Um, can you just uh, enlighten me uh, as to on the chart on the left where it says goal depth of knowledge and it says one and two and then two and three. Can you just briefly describe what that is telling me? So uh, the way that the state builds the items, uh, they are telling us and, you know, their design team, right, that they need items that are typically between one and two on the skills and concepts. So, so on that is first that part. one and two like kids would score levels one? No, no, no. The depth of knowledge is different uh, okay. than how they okay. will score. So it's... Um, Bloom's taxonomy, where, where it's the rigor of the item itself. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have 
a quick question yeah. too. So on um, 8F3, 8F5, what should those metrics be? Is there a benchmark or is there a standard? Like where are, like, where are we, our 49.95 compared to, like what number should we be comparing that to? Yeah, and, and so those are some details that uh, we'll know more about as we uh, take the state assessment. So last year, the, the previous year, we didn't take a state assessment. Last year, we took a state assessment, but we we're missing quite a few. And our pacing was off a bit. And so it's, it's really hard to gauge uh, mm -hmm. where it should be. So those 8F, 3, 8F, 5 scores were really low because we didn't hit it pacing-wise. And so as, as we get more systematic about it, we'll start to see how those numbers adjust together. Um, and so right now, this is just a point in time. Teachers should take this data and remediate. And so by the time you get state assessment time, that should be covered. So this, this should inform teachers ahead of time. We got some students that are lacking here that need additional support. So then come state assessment, they're ready for it. Okay. Um, and so I'm not necessarily gonna say, hey, we want everybody to be at 90% at this point, but we definitely want people to be there by state assessment time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we also want to look at the gaps. We, we want to look at these gaps in the same way. It's an indicator beforehand, before we get to those state assessments, so that we can catch it during the process. We can see that uh, this is math, and this is all math, so grades three, uh, through eight and then the high school courses um, and we break it down and we can view that at more detailed levels to have those conversations with our buildings but overall as a district we still have some work to do uh, we are still those gaps are still persisting across the year um, at best we'd like to see them close over the year I will say that we do have uh, five buildings that have gaps less than 10 percent um, in math, and we also have, we'll see in a few slides, ELA, we have five buildings, not the same buildings, but five buildings in ELA that are also, uh, that gap is um, more narrow than 10%, um, which is good, but still we, we have work. We have work to do here. Uh, we also look at it free and reduced lunch, a free, paid, and reduced price lunch. Uh, and we have gaps between those different lunch groups as well that continue to persist. And this is for math. The next two slides are for ELA. Uh, we do have two schools that uh, have less than 10% um, in both ELA and math. And there's various reasons for that. Um, but we continue to explore what they're doing well uh, so that we can expand that. And then for ELA, here's the free and reduced lunch. And um, as research would suggest as well, uh, reading is more impacted at the elementary level as we're beginning to read. Uh, and so we, we do see bigger differences um, in our reading scores. Now for next year, uh, we're going to continue this process. So uh, like we said at the beginning, uh, we're building a house here with our assessment system. Uh, and so this is, I think, putting the roof on it. And so we are backwards designing. So we are going to have the scope and sequence and the pacing guides ready uh, to go out to buildings and teachers uh, by the end of the school year, hopefully um, uh, in a few weeks, uh, so that they will be able to see quarter one uh, what the expectation is, what standards get hit. We're all on the same page there. They will also be able to see the district common assessments, how we're going to measure that at the end of the first quarter. In addition to that, those standards uh, will be identified uh, and ordered, rank ordered, uh, to the ones that are most impactful uh, for state assessment results. So then teachers at the start of the school year 
can start building their common formative assessments. They'll have in mind what they're teaching, but they need to define what success looks like and do that through their common formative assessments as a team. They then will have the opportunity to teach it and formatively assess it within their classroom. And then during the PLC time, all, the, all these data points will be able to come together <clears throat> so that we can better target and individualize instruction for students and start closing these gaps. Um, and all of this is aligned to the standards that the state expects us to teach, uh, the ones that uh, we have mapped out um, in the order that we have mapped it out so that we can really be focused and hone in and make sure that every child has a chance of success here. Any questions or comments? Uh, this is Kay. Uh, I like to make some observations. Um, one of the things that we kind of hear about a lot uh, when it comes to the legislation is just about um, how we're so far behind. Um, so I kind of want to point out a couple observations. Um, one, one of the things that we are seeing uh, from 2021 to 2022, even though we have uh, seen a little bit of a dip from uh, mid uh, for the end of 2021, uh, overall we've seen a growth um, in our students' performance. Um, and uh, specifically uh, with our students who are receiving um, free um, services or, or how we classify that. So I, I think it's important um, that even though we know that we have a higher um, goal in mind, that we take a moment to acknowledge uh, the fact that uh, we are seeing some gains um, and that, uh, you know, one of the things that perce one perception is uh, kind of coming back to school and some of the investments that we made in the last year um, is, um, has been helpful for our students. So just uh, wanted to point that out. Thanks. All right, let's uh, move forward with behavior. And so, um, as identified here, uh, we also talked about behavior earlier this year and showed some data. And so this will be uh, an update from the quarter one behavior. We'll see quarter two and quarter three in here as well. And also quarter four data through 420 uh, when we pulled this data. Uh, we'll also continue to work uh, through um, the two board committees, Parents of Color uh, and Equity Advisory Council uh, to make sure that we dive in and explore this data a bit more. Uh, but we do wanna go through some of this data. Um, we, we make the reporting available through PowerSchool. So teachers, are, teachers, administrators are able to go through. We have definitions in here as they click on um, the individual behavior. Uh, it does pull up definitions to help us calibrate and make sure that we are recording accurately. Uh, we also have the restorative questions in here as well um, so that we can mark those as appropriate. We have reset, uh, we, we spend a lot of time with our building administrators to reset uh, how we do behavior entries and uh, how we um, manage behaviors within buildings. And we've also provided reports uh, within PowerSchool that can be run at the, at the building level. So all administrators uh, have access to these reports and can run reports um, to validate and check their, their behavior data. We also spend time at the leveled meetings uh, talking to the administrators about their data and ensuring that it's as accurate as possible. Uh, one of the things that we looked at last time, this is uh, from the report, um, either October or November, I have to go back and look. Uh, so in that report, this is the first quarter report that we did, and you'll notice here uh, on the far right-hand side, we have little symbols over there uh, that indicate the difference, the discrepancy between the percent of students in our building, that's in the uh, first column there, um, the number first column, right? So uh, American Indian, Native Alaskan, there's, 
They make up about 8% of our students, or sorry, 1.8% of our students in elementary school, but accounted for 4.6% of the incidences, uh, which is a discrepancy of about 2.9%. Uh, so the red area, arrows indicated the ones where there's a large discrepancy. We had five of those arrows. You can see our data now currently, uh, we have one of those uh, red arrows where there's a large discrepancy, and that's high school black African American students. They make up 6% of the student body, but accounted for 16%, almost 17% of the incidences there. So that it, that's a larger discrepancy, and we flagged that. But we are making progress. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, do you mind uh, uh, kind of... Um Defining discrepancy, again, I think I missed that. So the discrepancies that we used the first time was 7% uh, or greater, and we use that same definition here, 7% or greater. Okay. So it's not that those discrepancies don't still exist, but because of the end counts, we gave it some wiggle room because we're dealing with percentages. Now we also looked at uh, the behaviors over time. I changed the chart this time. Before I had them where the bars were separate, but for space purposes and to put all of the quarters on here uh, with the schools and you'll see race e ethnicities, I combined the bars. So we'll see that this top, this blue bar right here on elementary schools for first quarter that is the total number of incidences. This orange bar, or 114, that's the number of students involved in those incidences. So we had students in here that were involved in multiple incidences. We are looking at trends. And in elementary, it's trending down. Middle school, it's trending down. Uh, although we still have some time there, middle school still remains high and high school is trending down. We are seeing that that first quarter in middle school and high school were a little lower, and we believe that's due to calibration, and we have worked with our buildings, uh, especially at those leveled meetings, uh, to make sure that it's accurately reporting, and that's why we see a bump upward, uh, because we were getting better at it. It was a brand new system uh, that we were introducing them to. Uh, we also break it down by race. Now, this is elementary, and again, it follows the same pattern where we have the blue bar is the number of incidences, the orange bar is the number of students involved in those incidences. Again, we're looking for trends uh, that, that we will explore, and all are trending down in the elementary level. In the middle school level, we actually see an uptick in the Hispanic category. Everything else is trending downward. Now this uh, kind of flagged us to explore a little further. We, we know and we can say that there are two middle schools where this is, um, most of these incidences are taking place. And we're able to explore that and um, look at the specific incidences, but also talk to the building administrators to see what's going on there. Uh, but that's one way that we use the data. We, we look for those trends. We identified one that was off a bit, and we can follow up with that. And we have. Uh, here is high school data also trending uh, down for the most part. We also looked at out-of-school suspensions. Again, the chart is set up the same way. We're looking for trends uh, across time, and we see uh, that third quarter we saw a spike, but we're dealing with relatively low numbers, uh, and so we looked in, into those specifically uh, to see what was taking place there. Here you have middle school. And the next slide we have high school. Uh, but one of the things that uh, we really wanted to explore is this data chart, 
where we are specifically looking at um, anomalies or discrepancies, uh, and we're looking at the uh, out of school suspensions is, is the top line, and non out of school suspensions is underneath it. So for Native American or American Indian, Native Alaskan, we have the different categories up top, and then whether it resulted in out of school suspension or not an out of school suspension. In a quick glance, we look over it and I tally up uh, how many categories are inversed for each of the, so where there's more out of school suspensions than non out of school suspensions and for each category. That, that lets us uh, take a quick look, but then we dive in much deeper uh, to look at the exact incidences uh, to see if one category or one uh, group is uh, receiving a, a penalty or a punishment uh, that may not be warranted or is out of balance. Uh, and so we do look at that data. And I know that that's been asked in the past and I have been hesitant to give it uh, because we are limited on the amount of detail we can go in uh, to each of these, but we do look at it uh, in this manner. Are there are questions or comments over the behavior data. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Conrad. This is Carol Kadu Blackwood, and I want to thank you on your work here. But um, on these, the, the charts of the columns, the, the blue and the yellow, I'm not seeing the Native American represented, but I do. I do appreciate that the, they're tallied in that graph. But I would, you know, I would like to see those in the columns. And so, so, so some of those are because of the really low end counts. Right. Uh, especially when it comes to out-of-school suspension, I feel like they could be identified if they've had an out-of-school suspension. So I have suppressed some of those low numbers because of that. Right. But I, I, I would like to see the trends because the other, the other groups had trends. So I would like to see those in the columns of trends. Completely understand. And for student privacy, I've suppressed the low numbers just because if you know that they were involved in an, if there was only one incident or two incidents or a handful of students, I suppress those low numbers. So I did not show this publicly because of that. And, and that's actually a good thing because we don't have that many. Um, right, but per capita, that's a, that's a pretty good number. One. Yeah, it's... Not that it doesn't happen, but I'd like to see it, the trends. It, okay. Thank you. I have a question. So is there an inverse relationship between like the academic numbers we saw for what was categorized as black and brown students as it relates to um, the behavior or discipline? Like, because the black and brown students were scoring lower academically. Is there like an inverse relationship with the behavior? Yeah, I, I imagine that there is a correlation between those two. Uh, I think it would be really hard to get at the causation of, right. of one go, uh, causing the other, but a correlation, uh, yes, typically there is. I don't have that number, so I couldn't tell you for sure, but I can get that. No, don't worry. It's okay. okay. Just curious. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, this is Kay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I would uh, agree with Carol. I definitely appreciate, um, I, I love numbers. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about uh, was uh, just that kind of trend what we're seeing with the, our multiracial students. And so I, wanted, I was curious if there's a particular type of behavior that we are seeing being reported uh, most so. And then uh, the other question that kind of adds on to that is uh, one of the things that we're seeing is, yes, we have, you know, kind of that uptick um, when students are returning back to school, but we're also seeing that more grow more so in that second quarter. So I was kind of curious about, um, you know, what were those trends um, in type of behavior um, in, in addition to what might be the plan to address some of that? And, and that was really part of our reset plans with buildings. And so we saw that uptick, especially in the middle and high school, uh, mainly due to reporting. Um, but the behavior specifically, we've been working with uh, buildings, building leaderships in those reset plans and our building goal check-ins uh, where we, d we are able to review that specifically with them. 
And I know you have another section to go through, um, but I do have a question. It's probably more for Dr. Lewis. Um, so we saw, and since I've been on the board even before, like there's been like a ongoing trend of our black and brown students not achieving to the level that they could. Um, but then we see the, the behavior disciplinary um, data as well. So are there any like programs that are proven to be effective to like reach our black and brown students? I'm not saying like it's an academic program, but is there a program that would inspire students to not really want to achieve, but just give that additional motivation? Because it's not about ability, because they all have the ability to do it, but something is there that's not pushing them to the other. Yeah, and that was one of the things that we looked at early on as and we, when we were looking at discipline, what we were finding was many of our students of color were being suspended or disciplined at higher rates for those subjective type things that we've removed from our discipline matrices. And so we see, we're seeing the numbers um, decline as it relates to discipline. But as it relates to the academic piece, it's just ensuring that we are providing access mm -hmm. um, to opportunities, access for students to be able to see themselves in the curriculum. Uh, really proud of the work that we're doing uh, with our cultural sustainable culturally sustainable resource criteria to select um, um, tools, to, to, to select um, um, curriculum resources that they will be able to see themselves inside the curriculum. And then also the work that we're doing, particularly at our high schools, around um, making sure they have access to some of the more rigorous courses, i.e. AP courses. So really just looking at um, our equity policy in action. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think I, I would kind of add on to that, just uh, more of this curiosity uh, part, is we've been hearing, uh, well, you'll hear me talk about it a little bit uh, later, but this uh, restorative practice. Um, and so do we, do we know how frequent, or because uh, we know that uh, in our middle school, restorative practice has been implemented uh, a lot further than our high schools, um, but is it, is participation mandatory? Do we know kind of what that participation rate is currently uh, with students participating in restorative practices when uh, we are having incidences? Yeah, so one of the reasons I didn't report specifically on restorative is because every time it's a non-tier three, uh, there's a restorative practice in use uh, in both our high schools and middle schools. Uh, I think that uh, Dr. Johnson and team has done a really excellent job in working with our buildings to put that into place. Um, but that is something that uh, I'm seeing in the data that they're marking um, that they are doing some restorative process uh, each and every time. Mm -hmm. you have a question? I had a question uh, for Erica and Dr. Lewis. Um, one of the uh, questions that I have had uh, based on some conversations I've had recently about our behavior data and restorative practices is around um, those circumstances that happen in our schools when there are allegations of sexual harassment or um, that kind of behavior. And I would like to better understand um, the interaction between the new Title IX requirements for investigating complaints related to those issues and how we are um, addressing them, you know, how that fits into the, the structure that you've described. And I don't want to, I, I don't mm -hmm. expect an answer tonight. It's just mm -hmm. something I'm interested in. So Eric, if that is something that other board members are interested in, I would um, be interested in more information. Okay, okay. thank you. That's something you want Dr. Lewis to dig into? Or? Oh, we can't hear her. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I wasn't speaking very now much. Yeah. I was asking the question about, um, I would like to better understand how our restorative practices work intersects with the requirements around Title IX and investigations related to allegations of um, uh, sexual harassment or other kinds of behavior that fall into that, the purview of the new Title IX regs. So I just would like to have a better understanding of how th those things work together. And I am asking if there are other board members who would be interested in that information um, as well. Okay, yeah, we have okay. more than four of us. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, real quick. <laughs> okay, I'll go, I'll go super fast. Uh, climate survey, last data uh, point here. We, uh, here's the response rate. This goes out twice a year. 
Uh, we try to get it out in January for first semester, then again in May for second semester. So this is first semester results. Um, we send out a written report along with it. Uh, two buildings didn't receive a written report because uh, they didn't meet the threshold for participation of 30%. Um, they also receive a PowerPoint slide uh, deck to be able to review with staff uh, some of the results. Uh, we, here's, here's a couple of the uh, sections on there, the questions that are asked. So here is the community section, and I'm showing these two sections for a specific purpose. Uh, but these are the questions asked about uh, community. And then these are the questions asked about leadership. And I share these two uh, because community was our highest and leadership was our lowest uh, when it came to the school climate survey. And these are the questions that are asked on the school climate survey. And here uh, are the results of that. Um, and this is all results uh, from the school climate survey, uh, all 851. And you can see leadership was the lowest. So uh, we had uh, 31 of the 32 questions actually had lower scores than last fall. Uh, we as a district have been going through some things this last year. Uh, this wasn't a tremendous surprise to many of us. We've had some challenging conversations. Um, we also had uh, the average score between three and four, with uh, 27 questions with that average score between three and four. Uh, we didn't have any below three, and we didn't have any that were five. Uh, so we're, we're right in there in the middle. Uh, we uh, expect that this will be part of our conversations and building goal check-ins. And so we'll work with building administrators um, to uh, work with their staff on improving those. We, I, I have seen uh, some building staff use that report and have teachers come up and like put sticky note suggestions on how those scores can improve, but things that they can, in, they can do to improve that climate. Uh, we also use this as part of uh, one of our goals, one of our KISA goals. Uh, and so here's the KISA goal that we have written for that. And you can see that our results uh, were down year over year. And so here's the leadership one and the scores associated with that. And then our staff and the scores associated with that. And then finally our student scores. And we show these because we have the goal to increase this over time uh, by 0.5. Uh, and so we expect to see growth on this uh, as we work with our building leadership teams um, to improve overall as a district. So with that, any questions or comments about climate survey? I just had a quick question, uh, uh, just for clarification or just examples. When you say work with building leadership, can you provide some examples of, of what that might look like? For example, when we're, uh, not for example, when we're uh, specifically looking at improving um, the rating on how our staff feel about leadership? Oh yeah, um, so it's part of our building goal check-in process. Uh, so they would set goals around that. Uh, we would hear from them on what they plan to do, uh, and then this would be an indicator where that would show up. We would watch that data, so they would set a SMART goal. Uh, we would watch that data. I would have monthly visits with them. Well, not next year, but um, have monthly visits with them. They will also come in for the building goal check-in uh, where we'll be able to hear and discuss uh, as a team with them how that is going, uh, and then this will be a data point uh, that we would want to see improve. Dr. Conrad, thank you. This is Andrew Nussbaum here. Um, I appreciate you presenting this. Um, on that first page, climate survey response rate, any hypothesis and or analysis about um, why it was two schools or programs that um, had less than a 30% response rate and any response or actions around that? Uh, yes, we know both buildings that didn't have that 30% response rate. Um, one uh, was, a, was a bit of a surprise uh, and 
we it will be rectified uh, with the staff. I, I, I think that maybe just one or two staff members, it was just light on staff members, and so hitting that 30%. Uh, the other was time, uh, time allocated for it. Uh, and so all the other buildings um, built it in within their schedule, whereas Free State had a more difficult time uh, with, with their schedule building that in for their staff and, and uh, getting that taken care of. We believe that it was time. Uh, and so again, we do it twice a year. We'll have another opportunity in May to make sure that that uh, gets done. Thank you. And then the last question I have, um, is it possible for at least the seven of us to receive a more in-depth um, climate survey, like some of the more of the raw data? As, as far as? At the building level or program level? Uh, I, I suppose so. I mean, I, I send that out to all the, the buildings, so the principals have access, the, the teachers have access. Um, they, they make specific decisions with it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we monitor those decisions as well, and, and so we use that data. Um, so I, I would just, uh, I guess, ask the purpose of um, your use of that data. Um. I think several purposes, just as an overall understanding in my role as governance and oversight, and then also looking for trends and patterns in, in my role, especially with some of the conversations we've been having about school closure, not school closure, elementary, middle, high school, and then um, all of those combined, just to see if these numbers are average amongst, or if there's highs and lows or outliers. Okay. I would say one of them, um, this is just based on experience, when we think about some of the end counts of some of these surveys, um, typically staff may feel like, why bother taking this assessment if nothing is going to change? Or why bother taking this survey if nothing is going to change? And so one of the things we ask our principals to do is go back and share the results of those survey, highlighting those two to three areas of growth and those two to three areas of celebration, and then talk about actionable items in terms of how we can improve. What we have found out, too, is that um, and I'll go back, we, we did not share with the staff that we would share this publicly or, or with the board. So I would want to honor our staff and let them know that, hey, this is something that the board is asking for next time. Because I, I, I want our staff to feel like they can be honest on, the, on these surveys. But I want to make sure we honor them and let them know that, hey, this may be shared beyond your building or beyond the district uh, administrative level. That makes sense? Yeah, I don't think that level of detail is necessary at the board level, board table. Um, Dr. Conrad and his team, they look at the trends, they look at the data, and they provide the information at the level that a board should have it. Now, if we think we want that level of detail, if four of us think that's important, then we can request it. But keep in mind the comments Dr. Lewis made. Um, staff may or may not feel comfortable with that. I think there's also the issue, too, of um, when you're talking about, especially the questions about leadership, um, if we are looking at it publicly at a building level, we're t looking at evaluative data that is identifiable to a particular employee. So um, we have to be careful about that, I think, from in terms of um, our role as employers and privacy um, of evaluative survey data. I was going to um, build on that. So the we used to it was available to the board members in pa in the past. We have seen climate um, surveys at the um, building level, and some of it was helpful data to kind of understand what was happening at the individual spaces. But we did run into that problem where you couldn't protect um, personnel information, which we as a board don't have purview of. Um, so depending on how leadership is defined within those surveys, that's one component. But it does seem like maybe if, and obviously right now this is not something you're prepared to do, but we likely could get, I would imagine, some high-level data on each. There's some data that we could get from each school that would be a compromise between the two if it were something that could be easily shared. I mean, if you're sharing it with buildings, it can't be too hard to share out in a shared document, for example? I mean, a shared yes, drive. Yes, so, but that, that's, where, that's where I hesitated, okay. right, of, of what level of detail mm -hmm. gets shared and uh, what's 
actually being asked. Um, and, and so there's probably some higher level stuff, but again, leadership is defined on the survey as the building administrator. Yeah, thank you. I think for me on this particular uh, conversation, I was able to kind of understand what I needed to based off of what was provided today. Um, I think for me, it kind of gets down to, you know, prior to creating action plans, you know, um, as we're developing out those SMART goals, are we asking staff to describe what does high level trust look like to you in action? Um, so I think for me, it kind of gets to, you know, prior to creating those action plans at the building level, um, are we, again, um, involving the staff and asking them to tell us what trust, high trust looks like to them in action? And, and just to echo Dr. Lewis really quick, I um, uh, apologize. Um, this, is, this is not a summative evaluation of those leaders, right? This is a, a more of a formative process of what we do with our students as well. And so this is us building capacity where we can uh, and watching growth over time. If we start reporting it out at other levels, uh, it could be viewed differently and that changes results and our ability to work with and grow capacity. Uh, it, it, and I think that we wanna be cautious of that and just be aware of that. All right, thank you for your report and all the work that you and your team and everybody else you collaborated with to make this happen. So thank you for that. Thanks. All right, good evening and welcome to the April 25th Board of Education meeting. The meeting is called to order and for the safety of all those in attendance, displays of signs or banners will not be permitted. Tonight's meeting is a meeting of the board held in public, not a public hearing or a discussion with the board. Patrons will be invited to share comments as part of the public comment portion of the meeting as outlined in board policy BCBI. That time is set aside on the board's agenda for members of the public to share their thoughts and it's not a time for dialogue and or question and answer session with the board. If your comments require follow up from the board or district staff that will occur after tonight's meeting. The district assumes no responsibility and or liability for the information shared during the public commentary. The views expressed are solely of those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Lawrence Public Schools. Please be respectful of the presenters and the board as we discuss and deliberate the issues and topics on tonight's agenda. Comments or actions that are disrespectful of presenters or disruptive to the board's discussions and deliberations, use of foul language and or threats to the board or others in attendance will result in immediate removal from the meeting. In addition, USD 497 provides public access to our board meeting through live streaming. The platform used for this live streaming has acceptable use rules for its content on its site. While the district does not delete or hide board meeting videos, the streaming platform may elect to do so if the content of the public comment or any other portion of the meeting is found to violate the platform's acceptable use rules. Thank you for your cooperation in these areas. At this time, a motion will be in order to approve the agenda. Do we have a motion? This is Carol. I uh, move that we approve the agenda. Thank you. You have a second? This is Kay. I second. Hill? Yes. Kimball? Yes. Kadu Blackwood? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Jones? Mm -hmm. Yes. Nussbaum? Yes. Smith? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. Next on the agenda is special recognition. I will introduce Dr. Lewis and then Shannon Kimball. Thank you, Board President Hill, and good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would say we have some scholars in the back. We do have some seats up front. Uh, this is about you this evening. We are recognizing uh, quite a few of our scholars this evening. Uh, we had, first of all, we had several uh, chess teams and individual students earn honors at the Kansas Scholastic Chess Association Championship. And we have our association president, uh, Lori Greenfield, who also teaches and coaches chess uh, over at Prairie Park Elementary, and she's here to share those results. So let's please give a big warm welcome to Lori Greenfield and his amazing chess players.
Good evening. I'm Lori Greenfield. My pronouns are she, her. And I am proud and honored to introduce um, our chess winners for the St uh, Kansas Scholastic Chess Association. I am a teacher at Prairie Park Elementary. I'm also the co um, chess coach, garden coordinator, and um, many other hats. <laughs> um, but I represent also the Kansas Glasser Chess Association as their president. First off, I'd like our K3 team to step forward. <laughs> and I gotta pull this up. We have James Compton, Logan, say it again, Yurkovich. Close. <laughs> Sorry, Logan. Um, Izu Chatu and Dante Mize. Um, James actually placed sixth in the entire state. Logan placed ninth in the entire state also. Thank you guys. That's awesome. Our, K, our K-5 team, um, we have, go ahead. We have tonight Dean Compton here, but who was not able to come tonight was Levi Brown, Xander Johnson, and Evan Brown. And James, well, no, Dean, sorry, Dean, um, got 18th place, um, and Levi was 10th place. Now we have two uh, alumni of Prairie Park that attend Billy Mills Middle School, and they both placed also at state. Uh, Greg Posh placed 24th, and Neil Compton placed 61st. <laughs> Next we have the Central Middle School, oh, no, Central Liberty, Liberty Memorial. Memorial Central Middle School. <laughs> Who's right. going to announce? Mm -hmm. This one? Yep. Um, so we are from Liberty Memorial Central Middle School, and we took first place at state um, uh, in the K-8 division. Uh, my name is Julian Bricker. That is Eli Kokolet. And that is Michael McConnell, and Dwight Sauters is one of our players who wasn't able to be here tonight, but that's us for it. And now we have, now we have uh, Lawrence High. Um, I'm Oliver Rubenstein. I'm the president of the LHS um, Chess Club. Um, this is Bryce Erickson. He got 23rd in state. Um, Marcus Sauters and Braden Sauterstorm um, got 12th and 43rd, and I got 3rd in state. <laughs> Lastly, I want to tell you that these are the top teams in the entire state for public schools. The only team um, that beat us uh, was a private school. So, um, way to go, guys. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations. Congratulations. Good job. Good job. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations. Good job. 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 Good job.
Congratulations. The parents, these so amazing, amazing scholars, please Good stand. Luck. The parents. And thank you so much, Ms. Greenfield, for your time and dedication to these amazing scholars. That's, just, that's awesome. That really is. So let's keep it going. We do have uh, Free State High School Principal Myron Graber here with us tonight. And he's going to recognize some spring student and staff honors. Please welcome Myron Graber. So good evening and thank you. Uh, unfortunately, my crew is, everybody's busy tonight, but I'm going to go ahead. We do have one group, but I'll go ahead and read the names of the other students if that's okay with you. So a couple of staff awards that, that are really pretty neat awards. Uh, the first one I'd like to mention is on March 16th, Judy Erpelding, an educator at Lawrence Free State, she's one of our orchestra teachers, uh, was selected as a Class Noble Educator of Distinction. Uh, this is put out by the National Society of High School Scholars. And it, the neat part about this award, it is selected by students. So she was nominated by a student and was awarded by a student. And this is a national award. It was nominated for a student for outstanding dedication and commitment to excellence in her profession. So that's really cool, a very cool award. Another staff member I'd like to uh, mention tonight is Lori Folsom. Lori Folsom. Folsom was recently named uh, the Jackie Engel Award winner. This is uh, the Jackie Engel Award is in remembrance of a, a uh, uh, distinguished educator in the state of Kansas. Uh, this is sponsored by the Kansas Collegiate Media, is given to the top Kansas high school teachers who have demonstrated excellence in publications and advising. So that's another very neat award. Uh, then I would also like to recognize some students. Uh, many of the students have different things going on tonight. Uh, they told me, Mr. Graber, we've already been recognized. Do we have to show up? So I said, no, but I'm going to read your name anyhow. So uh, to recognize uh, two state champion wrestlers that we had, Nolan Bradley and uh, Matt Markham, uh, both of them had outstanding seasons. Uh, if, you're, if you have any idea about wrestling, uh, the state wrestling this year was, was pretty intense, and Matt Markham, uh, defeated the number one wrestler in his weight class in the state who was undefeated in one of the most unusual matches I have ever seen in wrestling. But it was very exciting and Matt did a great job. Nolan had a great season, was always ranked at the top and finished at the top. So that was awesome accomplishment for them. Also in a previous uh, recognition of school, we recognized our National Merit Scholars, uh, the finalists. I will just read their names for you. Each of these students qualified in the, in the fall, they are named as semifinalists. And then they go through a series of uh, retaking an SAT and applying again to be named a National Merit Finalist, which puts them in the top uh, seven to 10,000 students in the country. So the students representing Free State were Hannah Guzman, Isabel Evans, Cheney Finkeldy, uh, Eric Carmen, Cortland Rockman, Jared Lowe's, Mary Schultz, Anid Singh, and those were the National Merit Scholars from Free State. Also recently, uh, the Kansas Governor Scholars were named. These are based on the number of seniors you have in your class, so you can nominate up to, uh, Free State can nominate up to five students. The five students representing Free State are uh, Sonia Baru, Jun Chung, Kenzie Markham, Anid Singh, and Paranav Bogetti. So those are the representatives. So one last student that I would like to recognize, and you might have read this in the Lawrence Times, is Soliad Edison. Uh, she had a very special recognition. She was recognized uh, for her work in equity in the classroom. Since middle school, she's been working for equity in the classroom. She is now a junior at Free State. Edison has a passion for connecting with diverse people and finding solutions to, is to issues facing marginalized students. For her work, Edison was awarded the 2022 Prince, uh, Princeton Prize in Race Relations for the Greater Kansas City Area. Uh, the prize is sponsored and awarded by Princeton University and alumni of the university is given annually to students across the country who have worked to advance racial equity in their communities. 
Uh, judges specifically outlined Edison's outstanding efforts to advance racial equity and promote understanding for her work as a leader of Free State's Equity Council and her vocal intentional efforts to provide students exposure to a more inclusive, robust social studies curriculum. She will be awarded a $1,000 prize and will attend the 2022 Princeton Prize Symposium on Race Relations, which happened in April, along with the other regional winners. Uh, throughout her leadership in the Equity Council, Edison has participated in conversations with the school administration, school board regarding unequal policies. Edison said the group has been able to share their perspectives as students on issues such as U.S. history, how it's taught in school, and the freedom of students to express their gender identities. An amazing award, and we're very proud of her. And she, she wanted to be here tonight, but she said, I've got lots of things planned. So, but uh, if you happen to see her, it'd be a great to uh, let her know that. Uh, the last group that's here to represent Free State, I think, is Mrs. Salmons, and she's going to present uh, some graphic design awards, and I'll have them come forward at this time. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Good evening. I'm Michelle Salmons. I teach graphic design at Free State High School. And I'm here as um, just representing these two lovely people next to me. We entered a design contest. It's actually, you'll hear Mr. Saltz talk a little bit. He has some students from LHS also speaking, or also um, here to be recognized. The Imagine Media, Con Media Festival is a really cool festival that Olathe Northwest has put on for almost 20 years now. And um, schools across our state and as well as Missouri um, submit things in graphic design, video, animation, and web design. So um, this year, I think it was, they said about 18 districts across Kansas and Missouri submitted to up to 300 different works. Um, here I have Abby Hostler. Abby Hostler won second place for her print media. And specifically, if you've been around Free State, she has designed all of our theater posters. And that is specifically what she, um, she, she won there, what was recognized there were, was her work she did for um, our theater. And then Emma Lou here, Emma Lou um, plays second place in branding, and that was for our team, uh, team STEAM here in the district. So connections there, also third place in manipulated digital illustration, which will be featured at the Lawrence uh, Art Center District Art Show this Friday, if you wanna make the reception, or in the next two weeks. And then also top five for print media, another team STEAM newsletter. So beyond these two, we also had Allison Sindrell place top five for making a world language poster for our school. Ryan Laird uh, placed third place for typography. And then Gus Peters made a great infographic um, at that place within the top five there. I'd say these two stand out above, well, of, for many reasons, they're great artists, they're talented designers, their technical skills are amazing, but their ability to take what they do and connect it to our community is stellar. So um, they've really helped contributed to building a positive community and a, an identity that we actually see around our school. So we're really lucky to have them at Free State. So. They were also responsible for our um, posters um, promoting mask wearing uh, as well. So thank you all so much. And next up, we'll go over to Lawrence High as uh, digital media teacher Zach Saltz has brought some filmmakers with him tonight. Yes, kind of continuing along uh, with what uh, Ms. Sammons was saying, uh, we also participated in Imagine this year and we had some top finishers. I'd like to recognize a few of them tonight. I'll first ask Milo Bitters to stand up uh, or to 
recognized Milo, uh, won second place for Animated Story for his short animation, A Speaker's Story. And this is now the second time we've actually finished, uh, second year in a row we finished in the top two in that category, which is a pretty big honor for us. And then Zach Mishka and Jackson Martin finished first place in the category of News Package. So big deal for our school. I also wanted to shout out a couple filmmakers who couldn't be here tonight. Um, I'd like to uh, mention Hayden Houts, Jackson Yannick, Arlo Payton, and Asher White. Their short film, uh, I knew I was going to forget the name. What was it? What was it? The Games of Foot. Uh, their short film, The Games of Foot, uh, is going to be screened in Portland, Oregon later this month as part of the International Silent Youth Film Competition, which is an international competition um, which hundreds of uh, films were submitted, but only a handful of which were chosen. So it's a pretty big honor for our school. Thank you. I don't want to miss, are there any parents of our high school scholars in the audience? In the back? All right, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. I have several retirements to recognize this evening. I would like to uh, congratulate Julie Riggs on your retirement. Please accept the board's heartfelt thanks for your 31 years of service and devotion to this community and its schools. In addition, I would like to recognize Kenneth Coons Jr. for nine years, Sally Berger for 13 years, Christine Everett for 20 years, Teresa Magnuson for 21 years, and Rini Stogsdale for 30 years of service and devotion to our community and its schools. Thank you all again, and congratulations from the board. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Next is the report of the Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Erica. Um, sorry, Board President Hill. Apologize. Uh, I appreciate Ed Zeller with the uh, Lawrence um, Breakfast Optimist Club uh, inviting me to speak this past Saturday morning. Uh, I shared with them some of the things that we're doing with our strategic plan as it relates to an update there. Also, some of our celebrations, many of our student um, celebrations that you heard tonight, I shared some of those with them and also touched on some of our um, the current ways that they, as a community partner, can continue to support our schools. Uh, in addition to some of our budget planning uh, processes. Um, the Optimist Club is a, indeed a great partner for us. Uh, they are, as a matter of fact, they are a, a tremendous leap partner for New York Elementary. Uh, they do the annual dictionary project for uh, fourth graders and also other youth activities that they support in Lawrence. So I was pleased to be with them on Saturday. Uh, our executive leadership team continues to monitor the uptick uh, in transmission in our community and schools. Uh, we are discussing data that uh, could be used to determine uh, whether mass requirements should be reinstated at specific schools. We are looking at plans from other school districts uh, that they have in place, and we do understand that there are differences of opinions uh, about mass requirements, and we certainly welcome students, staff, uh, and other family members to continue to wear masks at schools, uh, especially if there are personal or family medical issues involved. Uh, schools' families are invited to complete the Summer Learning Interest Survey in PowerSchool. We will again be using federal COVID relief funds or ESSER funds to support summer learning opportunities for our students at all levels this summer. The Kansas legislative, uh, legislature has returned to Topeka for the omnibus session. Uh, school funding is one of the big issues that has not yet been resolved. Uh, we certainly support an increase in state aid for special education services. Uh, although the legislature uh, has been increasing special education funding, uh, the amount has not kept pace with the cost of these services. Uh, special education funding uh, is $150 million, that's $150 million below the com uh, commitment required by state law. And so to kind of put that in perspective, uh, we are lacking approximately $4 million of state sped aid 
uh, special education aid that we should receive. And so essentially, uh, this would have taken care of our budget shortfall and the board would have just um, needed to make those reductions to cover salary. And so continue to urge your legislators to um, support special education to its full funding. Uh, we announced yesterday, no, we announced this just today, that West Middle School Principal Kathy Branson uh, has decided to retire at the end of this school year. Uh, we appreciate uh, Kathy's 30 years um, in, in education and service to the district, uh, including 29 of those 30 years over at West. Uh, many thanks and congratulations to Justin Deaver, a special education paraeducator at Free State High School. Uh, he's also was uh, most recently the recipient of the district Spring Class Act Award and also $500 thanks to our partners at Truity Credit Union. I want to invite all of our community out to attend the annual student art exhibition at the Lawrence Art Center. Uh, the opening reception and Vanguard Awards will be held from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. this Friday night. The exhibition will be open on display through May 13th. It is free and always worth uh, seeing our students' artwork from all grade levels. The Early Childhood Family Resource Fair will take place this Saturday from 9 to noon at Kennedy Early Childhood Community Center. Uh, with additional parking space directly across the street at the county fairgrounds. This is indeed a free event uh, for uh, the entire family. There will be more than 40 local organizations that serve young children and families. They're sharing resources and support. Uh, and then lastly, the school board will meet for its regular board advance this coming Saturday at uh, Free State High School. I have to say this, I was, um, I would say accosted the last time I came to Free State because I did acknowledge um, KU basketball winning the national championship. Uh, this um, person that's going to remain nameless said uh, this, he was a K-State fan and he reminded me that K-State, um, and I know I was going to mess this name up, um, Christian, the dancing Classy Cats won the national championship. And on that na uh, national championship team, we had three former Free State um, students. So congratulations also to K-State for winning the national championship Classy Cats. There you go, Mr. Rink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Right. That's it. Good. All right. Next is the report of the president of the Board of Education. So on April 13th, the Lawrence Chambers um, Government and Community Affairs Group invited Dr. Lewis, Shannon, and I to a panel discussion similar to what we did for the Lawrence Schools Foundation Board Retreat in February. And um, I spent the majority of my time talking about how the community can help our school district through inviting middle school, high school students um, into their businesses, because it was a, a group of business um, people there, um, to really expose these students to things outside the classroom and connect them with caring adults, um, kind of similar to like what we do at the LMH Health um, Leadership Academy. And also, um, and it really came full circle because at um, NSBA um, conference, many, many presenters emphasized the importance of mentorships and internships for our students. And so I am hoping that our community will follow suit and really give our students the opportunity to shine outside of the classroom. As we saw tonight, we have a lot of them shining inside the classroom, um, but there are other opportunities outside the classroom and also for them to be connected with caring adults that want to see them succeed. So I'm hopeful that our, dis our community um, will get there. And so last Tuesday, um, I was invited to um, join our district leadership team um, um, with the KISA outside team visit. And I had the opportunity to talk about um, our strategic plan, the role and makeup of the, the district site council, different um, board advisory councils and committees, and also um, leadership academy as well. And um, it was great to experience in detail, to learn in detail all the amazing things that our district's doing. I know we hear at the board table, sometimes it's kind of high level because of time constraints, but it was really, really nice to have the chance to hear everything that we're doing. We have a lot to be proud of in our district. We have some um, amazing staff, amazing students, and so we have a lot to be proud of. Um, and as Dr. Lewis mentioned, we are going to be having a board advance um, on Saturday. And so we spent some time putting 
um, a thoughtful agenda together, but I do want to recognize someone who has done the majority of the heavy lifting, Elise. Um, she's done an amazing job putting everything together, and I really appreciate your leadership. So. And that concludes my report. Next on the agenda is the public commentary. Do I have a volunteer to read the statement? Uh, this is Carol. The USD 497 Board of Education welcomes public comments and thanks you for taking time to talk to us about our policies and procedures. We set aside this time during our regular meetings to hear from the public. This is your time to share your opinions. However, complaints about specific staff or students will be heard by the board in executive session in order to protect the privacy of the individuals to be discussed. While you're not required to share your contact information, we ask for that information so district staff or the board can follow up with any specific concerns you may have. The board president will invite comment on topics not included on the agenda at the beginning of each meeting. Comments relating to agenda items are welcomed after the board has had the opportunity to, to discuss the topic. Please limit comments to three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Julie Brandstrom. Good evening. My name is Julie Brandstrom and I'm the CEO at Heartland Community Health Center. I have a written statement um, because I have a lot to say and I don't want to miss anything, so I'm just going to read it. I'm here this evening to speak about Heartland's school-based dental program, Healthy Futures, in the hopes that we will be allowed back into the Lawrence schools next fall. This program, which provides comprehensive dental care to children at no cost to families or to the school district, hasn't been allowed in the school building since March of 2020 when the pandemic first began. This means that many of our community's most vulnerable children have gone without dental care for more than two years. Oral Health Kansas reported in 2017 that 19% of the children in Douglas County have untreated tooth decay. It is safe to assume that this percentage is much higher now. Over this past year, we have heard from school nurses and parents that this is negatively affecting children. Health disparities have increased during the pandemic due to multiple reasons, including job loss and subsequently the loss of insurance. This dis the discontinuation of our program in the Lawrence schools has disproportionately affected children from lower income households. We know that these families face many barriers to accessing care, like transportation, the lack of financial resources, and often the inability to take time off of work to get children into a clinic for a traditional appointment. That's why this important uh, program has, um, that's why this program has been so important. It removes barriers to care by taking health care out into the community. Our dental team has taken many precautions to mitigate the risk of COVID transmission. Our teams are fully vaccinated and additionally we have developed contingency plans and have adjusted schedules throughout the pandemic as cases have fluctuated. It is clear that we will be required to learn how to live with COVID as we transition from pandemic to endemic. Healthy Futures is currently providing services to more than 80 schools in 10 Kansas counties. We are busy creating our schedule for next school year and we want to ensure that we reserve dates for the schools in our own community. In previous years, we've had more than 1,500 children enroll in our program. And as we are nearing the end of this school year, this is the time that we would traditionally be enrolling children for next school year. But because the district has not signed an MOU, we are unable to begin that enrollment process. At a time when the Lawrence School District is facing a significant budget deficit and having to make difficult decisions about cutting programs and staff, this would be a win for the district and kids in our community. Again, this program costs the school district and families nothing and ensures that all of Lawrence students have equitable access to dental care. We have sent the MOU to the district office and we respectfully request that it be signed and Heartland's Healthy Futures Dental Program would be allowed back into our school buildings this fall. Thank you. Okay, the next two in-person speakers are related to our agenda items, so we will come back to that once we get to that part of our agenda. Next, we will move to virtual. Okay. Justin, ready? Okay. Can you 
you guys hear me? Yes, we can. You see me? All right, whatever. My name is Dr. Justin Spees, and the school board doesn't allow me to speak directly or about uh, directly to or about board members, which also includes not being able to address Superintendent Lewis. So instead of doing that this evening, I thought I'd read a little story I wrote earlier today, and it goes like this here. Once upon a time in a land far, far away, there lived a school superintendent named Lewis Anthony, who was determined to run his school district okay, into the ground. We're going to mute you. You are violating our policy. Thank you. Next on the agenda is board commentary. Thank you, Erica. I wanted to share with the board, first of all, I wanted to start off by um, encouraging the community uh, to please reach out to our legislators uh, in the next day or so uh, to support a clean K through 12 fund uh, budget bill, as well as to share your support uh, for fully funding of special education under state statute. Our state statute says special ed should be funded at 95% of excess cost. Um, we're running at about 75%. There's a, a huge budget surplus at the state level, so there's definitely dollars available to fully fund special education this year, um, and it helps to hear from members of the community who are impacted uh, by those issues um, for our legislators and uh, legislative leadership to hear from you, so appreciate that. Um, Wanted to share a couple of items uh, that have gone on in the last couple of weeks. On uh, April 12th, I had the opportunity to attend a uh, teacher engagement and retention summit, uh, which was uh, an event to share the results of the 2021 inaugural Kansas Teacher Retention Survey. Um, Elise has shared with the board um, the access to the report that was provided to attendees. Um, at that summit. I really encourage uh, my fellow board members to take a look at it. Uh, they had shared statewide data, with, but also data specific to our school district. Um, USD 497 had a very high participation rate on that survey, um, about 671 respondents from our district alone, which was um, really amazing. Um, there's some very um, uh, good information about uh, what causes uh, what factors are influencing teacher retention um, and uh, teachers to stay in a district or leave a district. Um, I'll just say that one of the alarming numbers that was shared um, statewide this year, um, about 49% of the respondents statewide, and they had over 50% of the teachers in the state of Kansas respond to this survey, um, over 49% or no, 42, I'm sorry, 42% of all respondents statewide said that it's either likely or very likely that they will either retire, leave for another school district, or leave public education altogether within the next three years. Um, uh, we really are, um, as a state, as a, as a country, we are going to face a crisis in public education and educators um, if we don't take this kind of information seriously. So I uh, really encourage my fellow board members to take a look at that. Um, also, I'm uh, the representative liaison for the board to the Sunflower uh, Elementary School Site Council. I appreciate uh, the participation that I've been allowed to have as a liaison to their site council this year. We had our last meeting of the year on April 12th, and uh, a lot of the discussion was about uh, wrapping up how things went with their goals and then looking forward to next year how budget cuts might impact their school and some of the things that they would like to start working on around those issues for the upcoming year. Um, I appreciated the opportunity from the Chamber's Government and Community Affairs Committee to participate on the panel that Erica mentioned. Um, we had a really good discussion. Thank you to Hugh Carter for, for arranging that and to Kristen Flory for facilitating the panel. Um, we had a really great wide-ranging conversation um, about a number of issues, uh, including the ones that Erica touched on, as well as talking about um, historic funding challenges um, and, and really how how our school district budget is impacted by a lot of things outside of the district's control, including, um, I think one of the very interesting insights that came out of that conversation was including um, our uh, community's um, land use planning and what impact land use planning and, and home building, et cetera, has on um, enrollment growth for the district. Um, our facilities committee met last Thursday 
Uh, Kay and I are the board uh, representatives on that committee. We received updates on ongoing repairs and capital projects at a number of schools, um, district-wide projects, including some of the projects that are on consent agenda tonight. I was especially glad to hear about movement forward on the uh, HVAC repairs that we identified uh, to improve indoor air quality related to our COVID relief funds. Those are going to be moving forward pending board approval, so appreciate that. And then finally, um, two other things. I know I had a lot. There was a lot going on the last couple of weeks. Uh, I also participated on a panel for the KISA accreditation visiting team um, talking about uh, the board's work and our role in um, supporting effective communications and positive and supportive working environments. I was happy to serve on that panel with Lindsay Buck from LEA and with um, Hannah Allison Natal from uh, PAL CWA as well as Leah Wisdom from our staff. I just wanted to share that the visiting team members uh, uh, paid our district some very high compliments um, during and after that panel in terms of what they had seen during their day, and I really appreciated uh, hearing that feedback from them. Finally, um, uh, to just update the board, the, the working group that has been talking with Bert Nash um, about uh, progress in preserving the RAP program had another meeting um, on April 21st that I attended um, in, uh, on behalf of Erica. Um, we, um, the good news is that Bert Nash believes that it has come up with an opportunity to continue the program with some adjustments through its application to become a certified community behavioral health clinic. Um, I, uh, based on those conversations, I'm very excited at the opportunities that um, this potential um, shift presents for us uh, in a renewed and strengthened partnership that will also um, strengthen and support uh, mental health supports within our schools. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Evening all. Uh, tonight I have updates in three categories, uh, fiscal operations and equity. Fiscally, I have been uh, focused on strengthening my skills. For example, at the last uh, board meeting, uh, we had approved the financial reports uh, that had um, inactive student activity accounts that dated back uh, to 2001. Um, I'm a very curious person, uh, so I was like, oh, okay, um, how come um, do we have these inactive accounts that date back so far? So upon further investigation with my fellow board colleagues, which is awesome that we have a community like this, I, I was able to learn that uh, we, have, uh, we do have a board policy that directs how we can resolve these accounts. Additionally, I have learned that KSDE uh, guidance and facts outlines uh, what boards across the states can do to reallocate these funds into school buildings accounts to support students' activities. With encouragement uh, from uh, a board colleague, I was advised to share this information to the whole board tonight. Um, I hope uh, that is in doing so, collectively as a board, we can uh, make it a priority to resolve some of these inactive student activity funds in partnerships with uh, fiscal team and leadership to get things resolved and perhaps reallocate funds to school building student activities. Um, see uh, JH uh, board policy for reference. On the facility side of things, uh, with the operations meeting, uh, one of the notable discussions for me um, with uh, Shannon is learning that financially uh, we've been able to gift our district uh, with the ability to be able to afford uh, for us to be uh, to pay for um, repairing or replacements of iPod, uh, iPads um, at a cost to no families. Um, but uh, we're coming to a, a process and where that is likely coming to end. Why? Um, because it extends our budget. Therefore, in the coming month, we, we may be reviewing an income uh, scale coverage plan that may be added to supplies and costs on those one-to-one -one devices pending future board approval. Um, on an exciting note, though, um, it was shared that by moving forward with the investment of ex expanding our broadband uh, with the new vendor, we're expected to be saving a couple of hundred thousand dollars if I if I remember that right Shannon um, in the next two years and so when you think about that that's really exciting for us and uh, Larry and his team um, they are really uh, moving forward um, even after our initial budget discussion and uh, moving straight ahead and getting things done why saving costs and maintaining the quality of work so I just want to take a moment to say thank you Larry um, to you and your team 
Um, for, uh, I attended a uh, parents of color advisory team uh, meeting. Um, and in this moment, um, I want to take a moment to address the community because uh, I've been hearing a narrative that I'm not liking too much. So uh, regarding the progress of restorative practices within our schools, the narrative that we should be encouraging is that in the last two years, we have been beginning to train our staff in this practice. And despite the challenges widespread on awareness in our secondary schools and implementation in our building in the first quarter of training our staff, this should be celebrated. And as a community, we need to be leaning into the opportunity that, that already exists to help us grow in our knowledge and awareness of practices alongside of the work of responsive classrooms to address the social and emotional needs of our students. As a past chair, and assigned board member to the Parents of Color advisory team, Dr. Johnson and her team and the educators that are um, supporting this work are making strides in the implementation plan. It is monthly that we are receiving updates. Sorry, I need to take a moment. Um, get a little, uh, but it's monthly that we're receiving updates on restorative practices in our school. Dr. Johnson's team is continuously working to engage this team in dialogue. Um, and, and we had had over six times or more uh, to participate in things like workshops on microaggressions, attending equity talks, and it, the list kind of continues on. Being on this committee, being on this committee is not just about sitting there and hearing the report. We are an extension of Dr. Johnson and her team's work. Part of being on that team is sharing that information back with our schools and the community groups that we represent. So the narrative that our district, our community should be sharing is that our district is doing this work and is in the process of implementation and making steady progress to full adoption in our secondary schools. Therefore, instead of coming to the table with new solutions, as a community, we need to ask ourselves, how can we fit in with what is already established? And, and the answer is, reach out to the chair of these committees and share your intent to join this work. Or if you're already, already in, show up, because your voice matters, and without it, nothing changes. In closing, why I have done quite a lot of things uh, since we last met, uh, like Shannon and I attended a site a council meeting as we explored uh, the options within uh, mixed class uh, mixed grade classrooms. Um, I had the opportunity to attend <laughs> um, Dolly Parton Imagination a celebration to expand uh, the project in Kansas. That was super cool. Uh, Representative Sharice Davis was there. That was cool. Um, uh, I attended the conference for a governmental alliance on race and equity. Uh, that focus on building the work across sectors, so that's uh, school boards and cities and health departments. Um, I also attended the theater very young, which shares the importance of arts um, in the formative years from zero to five. Um, and doing so, it's really about being able to let us know that the arts are important to helping our youngest students develop. I also attended the parent information session on Montessori uh, that uh, Dr. Lewis and his team did, which uh, I was really surprised because even with my presence in the room, those parents did not hold back, <laughs> did not hold back. They were articulate, inquisitive, right on target with the questions that I have, and I'm really excited to hear more about this. Um, but um, I finally want to say to the 30 plus staff that will be concluding their service, to this district uh, between now and the end of the school year. Thank you for your commitment to education. The students' lives that you have been printed on, printed on are forever better. I hope that our paths cross again in the future and wherever, whatever you do next, know that you will continue to make a difference in the lives that you touch and thank you. Any other board? Okay. Sorry for the pause for a minute. Thanks for that um, in-depth um, summary, Kay. Um, so I attended the, EOC, the EAC POC meeting 
Um, I, it was also my final meeting with that particular group just to focus on more um, other commitments in the community. So I appreciate all of the um, all of the work that the EAC and POC has been doing. I also attended the policy committee. Um, it was We had a planning committee um, given the recent staffing changes. We also welcomed Kristen Ryan um, to the policy committee. Um, yep, sorry, just lost my train of thought for a second. Um, we are also um, meeting um, this coming May uh, to talk about the December 2021 KSA, KASB policy um, updates, and we'll continue those discussions. Um, we are also taking a look at the board operations manual and drafting and drafting of a new social media policy use um, for the district. We also heard an update from Dr. Johnson um, on the project to align standardized building handbooks um, across the district. Uh, just to keep on our radar, I also want to come back to a follow-up with um, Ann Ma when she visited us. So there has been a small group of um, Native educators that have been meeting here. Their last meeting was here, I believe it was April 13th at the University of Kansas. And I had asked about the follow-up on that meeting and what results and actions that came from that meeting. Um, so there is, they're moving forward with KSDE um, Board of Education leadership to form a new state level working group to advise on Native American education across the state, um, and as well as a statement from the board on um, mascots. So I just have a brief update. Um, Andrew and I were at the fringe benefits meeting and um, this is the kind of in the weed stuff that I get excited about, so I don't have as you know a thrilling or um, moving uh, contributions. But I do want to say that uh, we have a new platform coming for our voluntary benefits as we've moved to uh, the Hartford Group. And the exciting part of it is that um, in this enroll open enrollment time, anyone can um, get, uh, regardless of pre-existing uh, conditions, can right. That's exciting. Yes, that's the kind of, that's pretty exciting stuff. So I'm excited for our staff to be able to take part in that and to be able to uh, maybe expand the, the current benefits that they have. I love the Fringe Committee and want to say to Sarah Hamlin, who might be watching right now, that I look forward to her explaining all the details of this to our staff members in addition to um, our plan renewal, which came out pretty positively for the district overall. I also had a couple negotiations meetings. Uh, we are waiting for the state to make decisions. And like Shannon, I am um, writing everyone I know in the state uh, to contact their um, legislatures. We have very supportive representatives in the Douglas County area. So to ask your colleagues and friends and family in Kansas to seek fully funded special education is an imperative. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Carol. I've um, been kind of busy. Uh, let's see, On I, I was able to take in the Lawrence High School South Area String Concert, and sadly it was my daughter's, it's my youngest daughter's concert, but we were enjoyed by music from Billy Mills Middle School students, Liberty Memorial Central Middle School, and Lawrence High, and I just I want to echo Kay that we are very lucky to have such a fine, a wonderful fine arts program. And I was able to attend the Kansas Association for Native American Education um, meeting held at KU on April 15th. And members, uh, attendees included representatives from the four tribes of Kansas. And as I see the Title VI Indian education representatives from Wichita and our own Kelly Walker from Lawrence Public Schools and select uh, commissioner, Kansas Commissioner Randy Watson was there and members of the Board of Kansas Board of Regents were there as well as the Kansas Association of School Board members. And we entered into genuine dialogue. We acknowledge that the recent events that have exposed the need, we, we acknowledge the events that have exposed the need to reform our education systems to better serve American Indian students in Kansas. And like, um, Paula was sharing that there is going to be a position in a working committee created for those purposes. 
And on April 14th, I, I was invited to attend the Kansas, the Big Read kickoff at the, held at the Kansas City Plaza Library, uh, which included speaker, uh, U.S. Poet Laureate, a Muscogee Creek Nation member, Joy Harjo. And on April 13th, I um, met with the U.S. Attorney General's Office to discuss the implementation of Savannah's Act or the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Bill. And last week, I met with U.S. Uh, US Senator Jerry Moran to further discuss those implementation uh, updates and get updates for the Haskell, uh, he knew, Haskell Indian Nations University President Search. And on that note, let's see, I, I invite every board member and the public to please attend the Honoring the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women uh, event. The kickoff will be held this Saturday, April 30th from 12 to 5 at Broken Arrow. And last week I would, um, had the privilege and honor of driving Billy Mills Middle School and his wife to and from Billy Mills Middle School. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Anyone else? All right, thank you for your updates, board. Next on the agenda is the approval of the consent agenda. Do you have a motion? Ms. Shannon, I move the Board of Education adopt the items listed on the consent agenda. This is Carol, I second. Kimball? Yes. Kadu Blackwood? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Jones? Yes. Nussbaum? Yes. Smith? Yes. Hill? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. Next on the agenda is the Title IX report, Dr. Anthony Lewis. Yes, thank you, uh, Board President Hill. Uh, if you recall at a previous board meeting, uh, we were the board was inquiring about our Title IX report and status uh, of that. Uh, we got some spring numbers to um, Mr. Goheen, who you hear from in just a minute. Uh, he updated that report and we received it this week. And so as soon as we received it, I reached out to board officers and said, can we put this on the agenda? Uh, this week, and so it's obviously on the agenda this week, and we're happy to have with us uh, Greg Goheen, who will walk us through our um, Title IX analysis. Greg. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys tonight. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, as Dr. Lewis indicated, um, he originally approached me about um, doing a Title IX analysis report. I think it was late January, early February, and we started looking at the uh, numbers as we started putting the process together. And um, at, for reasons that will become somewhat apparent, I think, as we go through the report, uh, we had some concerns that frankly relate to unintended consequences, I believe, from the COVID pandemic. And so we want to kind of run through that analysis so that you guys can see what those numbers look like. I want to give you a little bit of background on how the Title IX analysis works for your programs so you have a way to understand the, the process, and then we'll focus on the, the actual report and the analysis itself. Let's see here. So Title IX itself is just a statute that's passed by the federal government and simply reads, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation or be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So Title IX apply, actually applies to all of your programs at the school district, not just athletics. It applies to your band program. It applies to your debate program. It applies to academics. It's across the board prohibition upon any sort of discrimination based upon the basis of sex. I think I heard earlier uh, this evening there was some discussion about Title IX in the context of harassment and policies of that nature. It applies in that regard as well. But the focus of what we were looking at is on the uh, athletics and what the athletic programs looked like. Um, and so the athletic programs are actually dealt with in Title IX's regulations. And I didn't cite all the regulations, but if you have curiosity, there's more detail in the report, and you can also look them up at the CFRs. Title IX regulations generally require that the provisions of equal opportunity for members of both sexes in athletics based on a variety of factors to include whether the selection of sports and the levels of competition effectively accommodate the interests and abilities of both sexes. And so what's important in this analysis, and you see it through the regulations, you see it through the case law that's out there, is this notion of equal opportunity, not necessarily equal equality in terms of numbers, but opportunities that are available to individuals of both sexes to participate in athletics in the context both of their interests and in the abilities. So the abilities factor that plays into things like, and you'll see it in some of these later uh, factors, deals with things like having a JV team or a varsity team or a club team and making sure those levels of, of competition are equal or proportionate at least to the enrollment of your student body in terms of, of, of 
uh, a breakdown along gender lines. So how do you figure out if you have that sort of proportionality, that, that equal, equality or at least equal opportunity in terms of Title IX? And Title IX has some policy interpretation that was done by the Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights that everybody follows, all the court cases follow it, OCR follows it if they come in to do an analysis of your program. And they have a three-part test. And the way these three parts are sort of divvied up, you don't have to, in order, the three-part test gives you what's called a safe harbor. So if you meet one of the three parts of the test, your Title IX program is generally considered to be in compliance if OCR were to come in and take a look at it. And so when you have um, these, these analysis of these tests, uh, these are things you can run through to see what this looks like and see whether your program is going to be found to be compliant with Title IX or whether you could be facing protect, potential uh, allegations of noncompliance or issues with noncompliance. So part one of the test is the one that we, we focused on primarily in our analysis, and I'll tell you why here in a second. Part one is generally the, the only one that's really objective in nature. So uh, part one deals with looking at um, the participation levels, interscholastic levels of participation, opportunities for male and female students that are provided in numbers substantially proportionate to their respective enrollments. So you take a look at the numbers, and we'll walk through those here in a second. The other two sections of the, of the test uh, don't come into play really unless you fail to meet part one. And then you look at part two, and part two is, okay, we've got a program that perhaps doesn't have equal levels of part participation that are proportionate to the enrollment, but we're a district that is growing and can show a history and continuing practice of expanding programs. So it really deals with a situation not where there's a contraction in programs, but an expansion of programs. And you can say, hey, yes, we're, we're not proportionate right now, but we've done surveys, we've, we've gathered data on interest, and we're growing in our participation levels. We're adding programs to try and meet those needs. Um, part three deals with um, situations where perhaps the uh, participation levels, uh, which are dependent upon kids actually deciding whether they're going to play a particular sport or engage in an extracurricular activity, uh, or maybe aren't meeting uh, the proportionality requirement in one, but the uh, opportunities that are out there are meeting the interests and needs and abilities of the individuals who are expressing an interest in participating in those programs. So think about it of the situation where you offer equal opportunities. This is really designed for the college level or the college level that the Department of Ed has said this applies to the high school programs or K through 12 programs as well. But you think about it in terms of scholarships that are available as opposed to scholarships that are actually accepted. So you might have a situation where you have equal numbers of scholarships that are available for male and female students, but for whatever reason, interest, whatever it might be, a disproportionate number of uh, female athletes accept the scholarships, whereas a larger number of male athletes uh, accept the scholarships. So the question then becomes what do we mean by this proportionality and how do we interpret that part one of the three-part test. So in determining whether opportunities for, for boys and girls to participate in athletics are substantially proportionate or part one, the courts have said, and OCR has agreed, there's really not a set ratio for what constitutes that substantial proportionality or uh, when it's not met, what results in, in disparity or a violation. However, the courts have taken a look at this, and generally what they say is if you have a 5% or less variance between the, the uh, ratio of male to female uh, uh, students in your enrollment population versus the participation levels and your athletic programs, then that generally is considered to be compliant with Title IX. That doesn't mean you're not compliant if you don't meet that ratio, it's just you fall within that safe harbor if you're under that 5% variance. So that becomes very important when you're looking at these, these things, when you're trying to make decisions about whether if I'm going to modify programs, if I'm going to offer or not offer particular programs, whether that's going to impact that, that variance level becomes an important factor. Variance rate is simply the comparison of the percentage of those high school students uh, desegregated by sex to the percentage of high school students desegregated by participation in sports by sex as well. And so it becomes just basically a mathematical formula where you take a look at it and kind of run through what those numbers look like. Um, we do, I do want to point out one thing when you're looking at the percentage of athletes, we do what's called a duplicated uh, student count. So 
The reason you do that is because I might have a student athlete that participates in more than one athletic event. Those are all opportunities for athletic participation, so you don't discount them simply because it's the same student who maybe participates in more than one opportunity. And that's uh, consistent with what the Department of Ed's guidance is on that piece. So this is where we kind of get into the heart of it, and I kind of want to spend a little bit of time talking about these numbers and taking a look at it. So historically, we, we took a four-year look back. Um, Three-year look back is traditionally what um, the Department of Labor takes a look at. We did four years because you had COVID sort of in the middle of what was going on here. And as you can see fairly quickly, the COVID pandemic did have a uh, effect on your numbers for, rather substantially, quite frankly. And that was a bit of a surprise to us. And that's why we wanted to make sure we had the spring numbers this year before we completed the report and the analysis. And that's what took the majority of the time to get the analysis done for you. If you look back at the 2018-19 school year, for example, you can see that um, your participation level um, and the variance level for uh, comparing school uh, participation in uh, sports or athletics as compared to the proportionate population of the, of the two high schools, and you show a variance rate of 3.7%, which is well under the 5%, so you definitely fell within the Title IX compliance ratio. Um, even if you eliminated uh, gymnastics, for example, which is one of the programs I know that was being looked at, uh, you would have dropped up to 4.7%, but you still would have been that safe harbor range for Title VII or Title IX, so you still would have been compliant with Title IX at that point in time. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that program at the tail end of this, but, but that's why we're looking at these numbers to see what the impact of reducing or eliminating a particular program might look like from a Title IX compliance standpoint. You could do the same thing with any of your other programs that you have and do the same number analysis. Um, the next year, COVID hits in May, or March rather, and we send everybody home. Well, the impact of that disproportionately impacted your female athletes rather substantially because you have a larger number of uh, sports for uh, the female athletes in the spring than you do in the fall or the winter. Uh, they seem to be more consistent there. You've got football in the fall, for example, and so you have a disproportionate number. And when uh, COVID hit, you can see the impact upon this uh, rather markedly. Um, so your number jumps up to 9% um, variance, clearly outside the uh, uh, guidance by Title IX. Um, and so at that point, you're out of compliance with Title IX, although not necessarily in violation of Title IX because obviously we had no control over the pandemic. That's not really a reflection of the opportunities that are being provided. So then we took a look at uh, 2000, or 2020 and 2021, the next school year, COVID was less of an impact in the sense that we had um, year-round sports, but it still did appear to have an impact. And you can see the numbers did drop back down on the variance point to where it was back down to around 5.9%, which is still out of compliance with that safe harbor provision under Title IX, um, but within range to where it seemed like maybe we were going back down and our, our, our thought was, okay, well, let's wait and see what the numbers are for this year and see if that's continuing to slide back down to where you're within the compliance range. Unfortunately, um, even with the spring numbers, when you look at 21, 22, uh, the participation variance actually goes back up. So the participation variance, including all the spring sports, goes back up to 7.8% in terms of the variance. And um, if you took a look again at the, um, say removing gymnastics or eliminating that particular program, uh, the number would go up a little bit higher, although it's not statistically significant in terms of that, you still would be out of compliance either way under part, part uh, one of the test. So in looking at that and kind of what does that mean, we wanted to walk through and try to take a look to see if we could make some determination as to what factors might be impacting that participation variance, because that plays into whether you're in compliance or not ultimately with Title IX and ultimately plays into what flexibility you have to make determinations as to what programs you're gonna offer or not offer uh, in terms of your sports uh, with, with the school district. So clearly uh, COVID-19 appears to have had uh, the most substantial impact on it. Um, what is interesting is it appears that the pandemic um, may not have only impacted participation during the particular years that, that the spring sports were canceled, but it, may, it appears to have had a lag effect on participation in uh, 
girls sports uh, during the um, post-pandemic period that we can take a look at here in a second. Um, obviously, in 2020, uh, you can almost take those numbers and just disregard 2020, 2019-2020 when the pandemic started because you're really not comparing apples to apples in that comparison. Um, another thing that impacted it, which is a little interesting, is all, your overall in high school enrollment has declined over each of the last four years, uh, while at the same time, the percentage of male to female students has increased. And that is having a, a slight impact upon how the ratio works together because you're having a larger proportion of male students in comparison to female students, and that is impacting your numbers to some degree. And then the participation level, and this is really where you kind of get down to taking a look at the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of what's affecting these numbers and gives you some guidepost to perhaps take a look uh, at your programs a little more carefully to see what might be underneath these numbers uh, to see if this is going to be a blip on the radar or if this is something that you need to reevaluate what some of your programmatic offerings are. And that shows that the overall participation by female students in high school sports over the last four years, uh, particularly going from 2018 to 19, which is the last pre-COVID year we have, to the current year, is showing a, um, a, a, a decrease in overall participation by uh, female students, and at the same time is actually showing an increase in participation by your male students. So you've got both populations going opposite directions, which is what is, is creating the number that we're seeing now, the 7.8% on the variance. Um, participation in particular is down for from 2018-19 in girls track, swimming, bowling, tennis, uh, gymnastics, and cross country. Notably, participation is up in girls' soccer uh, and basically even in softball, basketball, and volleyball. So without getting into the nuances, because we don't have the information to be able to actually tell what's behind those numbers, it does show that those participation opportunities are still available. You just don't have athletes that are taking advantage of those opportunities for whatever reason that may be, and that's something you probably need to to do a little bit of a dive down to take a look at to ensure that this trend does not continue because if it does continue as a trend, it suggests that you're not meeting the interests and needs of your female uh, athletes in terms of offerings of programmatic issues. Um, we, we had gathered data and it had originally intended when we were looking at this to take a look at some of the other um, components that are out there for uh, non-sports activities, which uh, in terms of comparison, the way OCR looks at it, they just look at sports versus sports, but there's um, certainly when you get into these other uh, parts of the analysis, you can take a look at terms of interests, and if you have other extracurricular activities that are occupying interest levels uh, that are competing with your sports activities. So for example, if you have something that's non-athletic that competes for time with athletic sports opportunities at the high school level, which is different than it is at the college level, you can take that into account in that part three of the, the three-part test because it reflects or shows that there, you may have an interest that's are being satisfied by other opportunities that are not necessarily athletic opportunities. And so that is one component that you can take a look at and see, see what that looks like. Um, the last slide I have here, and then I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have and get into some of the specific, any of the specific numbers you want or other things out there. And, and I, before I talk about the slide, I did want to point out, we did quite a bit of looking for research to see if there were other studies or anything out there that had taken a look at sort of a tail on uh, student participation or impact on Title IX compliance resulting from the pandemic. There's very little out there right now. But there is a pretty good study that was done by the uh, Michigan uh, Journal of Environmental and uh, Administrative Law that took a look at COVID-19 and Title IX and the impact of COVID on the uh, athletic disparity in the Big Ten and the Big 12. It's a collegiate study, so it's a little bit different than what would be out there for uh, high schools or K through 12, but it showed data very similar to what you're seeing reflected for uh, your programs. So that suggests that this really is tied to the pandemic and is, a, is something that you're gonna post-pandemic have to take a look at how to address and how to sort of bring that participation level back and encourage female athletes to re-participate or re-engage in those sporting opportunities and really take a hard look at that piece or that component. Um, the gymnastics program, 
is one of the things we're asked to take a look at. And it, it was a program that has declined in participation, even though the opportunities are still available. Um, and so um, in, in 2021, 22, uh, just looking at the overall participations, participants in high school athletics, and again, these are duplicated numbers, you almost had, well, you had 1,900 participants roughly, and 22 participants in the gymnastics program were roughly 1% of high, th high school athletic participants. So the gymnastics program does not have a real major impact on participation numbers or even the variance participation. It's less than 0.7% just given this, the low number of, of participants. Uh, but because this is an ongoing program and because you can't rely on that part one test because you're not in compliance right now or you're not in that safe harbor, this is a factor in that part three of the test, which is the only other one you could rely on for compliance under Title IX. Uh, because it's an ongoing program with participants that are active in the program, that does suggest and would create a presumption that that is a level, that is a sporting opportunity where you have um, interest from a underrepresented class of individuals. And if you were looking to um, take actions that were going to impact that program for other factors, and there are other factors that the Title IX test or analysis looks at, for example, availability of competition from other uh, competing uh, um, schools is a factor. Uh, interest levels, cost, are there other opportunities that the district could support that would be better from a financial standpoint? Those are all valid considerations that can be taken into account. But if you're going to take those into account and you're going to make an adjustment, you cannot do that in a vacuum given the circumstances you currently have. You're going to have to look at the overall participation levels and likely make adjustments to either increase opportunities in other level, other areas for your female athletes uh, to create opportunities for them at an interest level that's higher or uh, make similar cuts uh, to address that disproportionality post-COVID that is reflected in your participation numbers from your male athletes and effectively eliminate programs uh, in conjunction with uh, any uh, program that you're going to eliminate that's primarily uh, female athletes. So you can't do them in a silo. You're going to have to do it overall looking at the program as a whole. Um, sort of taking a step back and looking look big picture, um, this may be something that is a short-term trend. It, it very well may be. It may be that next year we have full robust return to participation in, in, in athletic uh, at both the male and female side of the um, sports programs. But it is something that you probably ought to be taking a look at and trying to perhaps even do surveys and take a look at, at what the interest levels are from your female students uh, to see if you can address these programs and, and encourage increased participation. If, if you don't do that, you are going to run into a more long-term compliance situation down the road. So with that, I'll open it up to questions that anybody might have. And sorry for the long-winded explanation to get there, but you can kind of see how the data surprised us out of the gate. Um, I would have expected the participation levels, frankly, would have been low across the board from both both sides of the table, and they weren't. And so that disparity that leapt out from the beginning, we really needed to make sure we had the numbers right and see if we were analyzing correctly whether it was something other than, than COVID, and it doesn't appear that it is, but, but that's what the data show. Thank you for your report. Sure. Shannon? Mr. Goheen, thank you for that explanation. I appreciate uh, uh, the clarity that you laid out. Um, the, the three-part test. I'm wondering, um, I am very interested in the journal article you mentioned. Sure. Is that um, publicly available or is it something that you could provide? Yeah. No, it's, it's publicly available. I'd be happy to provide would, it. I can provide it to okay. Dr. Lewis and he can send it out to the board. Um, just, I would be curious to read their analysis of, of yeah. that at the collegiate level. Um, thank you. Any other questions or comments or feedback? I was, uh, um, I really appreciate the detailedness and so I was wondering if you could just like kind of give like a very short summary for our friends at home who may have were listening and then at some point and, and got lost in the numbers yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, the very short summary is your your participation in athletics by your female students is down from what it has been in the past and as a result of that that's resulting in a um, disparity between the levels of opportunities that are available for uh, your male and female students in the high schools. And that disparity needs to be addressed at some level in order to make sure 
that it is not being caused by something other than um, just a lack of participation, a lack of interest in the current group of individuals you have coming through the schools and, and to create new opportunities to address those interests that the current student bodies have. And therefore, um, in your perspective, um, girls gymnastic is something that we should continue to if you should let me let me put it this way ultimately whether you continue a particular program or not is a, is a decision by the board to make um, but if you are going to make adjustments or not continue the gymnastics program you cannot do that in a vacuum based upon the data you've got you're going to have to either eliminate um, a uh, boys program of some sort so that you reduce your numbers down to where they're going to be consistent with that part one uh, analysis, meaning that you're going to have more proportionate levels of participation, or you're going to have to find other opportunities that your female students are more interested in than gymnastics to increase those participation levels back up to a number. So it's, it's one of two things you're going to have to do, or maybe a combination is you can't, you can't really right now where you're at um, get rid of the gymnastics program, even though it has a very small impact upon your numbers, it does show that you have an interest level by the underrepresented group, okay? So if you're going to eliminate that program, you need to increase opportunities in some other area for that underrepresented group and at the same time probably reduce some of the opportunities for the, the male students so that you have the numbers coming back into alignment. Uh, thank you. And then along that, you, if you, um, for example, if you wanted to create other opportunities, you also have to balance the participation. So you can't just say, now we have more spots in this particular sports for female athletes. You have to demonstrate that there's an interest in participating in that. Correct opportunity. Thank and, you. And it has to be at a, at, a com at a comparable level of competition. So for example, you can't go out and create a club team. Mm -hmm. Your soccer numbers are way up. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting, right? But that doesn't mean that you can go out and create a club level soccer team and replace that with a varsity level, replace a varsity level gymnastics team with a club level soccer team or, or JV soccer team, or I don't know how many, how many levels you got of soccer. It must have a lot, but um, I, you can't replace a lower level of one sport to replace an upper level tier of another sport. Thank you. This is Carol. Um, you brought up a really good point about um, uh, you know, type helping another program, say for boys, for, uh, for example, you have this, uh, I'm looking at the participation in 2021 is down, and you, it, it, down from 2018 to 19 in girls track, swimming, bowling, tennis, gymnastics, and cross country. Now, my, both of my daughters participated in the Lawrence High bowling team, but it's interesting to note there that, you know, for Lawrence High and Free State, the children, the students provide their own transportation to and from practice. Is that something that we could look at in terms of, and, and transportation is, a, is an issue and a cost for our, our, our students, boys and girls, for bowling. Is that something that we could address here? I, you, you would want, one of the things you might want to do is, is survey your coaches or your coaches are probably your best resource to figure this out. Find out why you have lower participation. I mean, your girls track is down 26 kids from last year or from, from 28, 2018, 19. Um, the swimming's down 35 kids. So those are big numbers um, for your programs. So the question is, well, why? If it's transportation, then that's definitely something to take a look at. Um, if it is, um, you know, just a lack of recruitment by the coaches in the buildings or encouragement, that's, that's an issue. Is there something else that's drawing their attention away from those sporting opportunities to do something else with their time? Those are things to look at. But you don't have that data. You'd have to, you'd have to gather that data through either surveys or uh, through anecdotal evidence from talking to your coaches and things of that nature to be able to determine that and determine whether there are other interests that would encourage them to participate. If there are barriers, you certainly would want to address that um, right out of the gate if there's any kind of barrier that's preventing that participation. Uh, cross country was down 14 over that, that time period. So th those numbers add up pretty quick. And, and frankly, if your participation numbers were at the same level as they were 
four years ago, uh, you'd be proportionate, you'd be fine, and then you could make adjustments based upon budgetary concerns and, and lower participation in a particular sport. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. do you have a question? Yes, I just had a quick question. So now that we have received this report and we know that we have um, gym, our athletes that have kind of been waiting, is what's the next step for us here? Because um, on mm, deciding if we're moving forward with it or, or not, because I, I feel like we're kind of to the point in where we might be able to move forward, but I don't know how the process works here. Dr. Lewis, mind speaking to the timeline? Yeah, that would be the direction that I would need from, from the board. Um, and keeping in mind, uh, there were some other factors um, that caused even administration prior to me to look at gymnastics, i.e. the safety. So we would need to look at um, the safety of the equipment, um, not being able to host meets here, probably reach out to the Sunflower League. Um, I can hear you, Dr. Lewis. Yes, yeah, so probably reach out to the Sunflower League as well. Um, one of the... Um, I guess factors that we did discuss was our ability not to not to be able to host meets here. Uh, in addition to, like I said, the cost of the equipment, the safety of moving the equipment, um, which I think we can solve that issue. So we'll just need direction from the board because there may be a cost. Well, no, not may there will be a cost associated with this. And 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 to be clear, those other factors are things you can consider under that Part Three of the Title Nine test. It's just. You've got to look at it holistically. You can't look at them in silos. You've got to look at the whole picture. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of thoughts and follow-up, Dr. Lewis. Um, you were mentioning uh, direction from the board. Um, it seems like given the, num the number of things around which we might need to collect information and data that making um, any decision to end a program this year is likely not um, feasible. Right. I would agree. I would agree with that. Okay. Um, another observation I would have is that um, while, while I think that there's a likelihood that, that, that COVID does, has had an impact, um, I personally am s surprised by uh, the size of the disparity in participation this year. Um, and so one of the questions I would have in follow-up would, would be some of the questions that Mr. Goheen mentioned around what are what do our coaches and our building leadership believe are the factors that are um, uh, suppressing the participation levels for our female athletes? Um, and uh, Mr. Goheen, were these these are just the high school programs, correct? That you evaluated? They are. We 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 gathered information on the um, uh, middle school um, as well. We've got we've got numbers. We did not put those into this analysis because the gymnastics program and is the, only, is only at the high school and so we really right. we're looking at just okay. the high school levels um, some of that data could be used to, to figure out lead into interest to the next year too um, mm -hmm. which is again unfortunately survey data that you're going to have to to gather in some fashion but you could get that from the middle school level and you have a much smaller offering of um, sporting opportunities at the middle school level so it's really not quite the same comparison uh, but it certainly is something that you could take a look at. And uh, frankly, you could also look at your other extracurriculars as well. I just didn't want to overcomplicate this particular analysis uh, for the board. Okay, so so I guess in, in summary, Dr. Lewis, my feedback would be that I don't feel we can make a decision to end the gymnastics program this year given this data personally. That's, that's my read of this data. And second, I would be interested in administration's um, uh, perspective and plan on following up to, to look at um, some of these other issues um, to boost participation of our female athletes in our, exi in our existing programs. Does the board agree with that? Yes. You know, uh, I would say beyond that, like it, based on um, the trend that we're saying, seeing, 
that it's not just next year, it's probably several years out before you would be able to see adjustments for female athletes. And so therefore, I would want to understand what do gymnasts need so that they, we feel confident that they're safe, they have the equipment they need to be successful, and they can participate at a high level. So in addition to what Shannon has said, I think we need to understand what is the additional cost and how do we support them in, in um, other facilities if we, can't, if we can't do it here within the district, because it, this doesn't look like it's a trend that we're going to be able to fix um, in a, a year's time, particularly if um, there is a calculation that's not just the number of opportunities you create, but the levels of participation. So getting students interested in a new um, experience might take some time. Uh, so th that, I guess that would be the in addition to what Shannon has said, I want to know what we need to fully support gymnastics so that they don't feel like the rug's coming out from underneath them in the next year because that would impact my decision as an athlete to participate in that sport if I didn't think I was going to be able to see it through my yeah. high school years. Yeah, and I'll say for me, it's the, the safety issue is the yeah. number one. You have you know folks moving the equipment. If we can address that, mm -hmm. uh, the other piece of that is, and this may cause for a conversation to the Sunflower League to see if they are okay with us mm -hmm. continuing to not, not host meets here and or um, look at another location that we could possibly lease. Um, Thank you. For those meets. So I'm just trying to wrap my head um, around this discussion because, again, there's, there's some parts here that uh, probably predated me. Um, being here. So um, so I think what I heard you say, um, and definitely correct me, is that um, originally, um, so where we're at, are, where we're at now um, is that uh, in order to move forward, we are looking at investigating exactly how much, uh, in addition to the $10,000 that we were originally talking about for gymnastics, what would it take um, to fully fund the program. In addition to that, we are also looking at where meets would occur, um, and then maybe at a later board meeting, next couple of board meetings, I'm a, we would get an update and make a decision on that. Is that kind of what I'm hearing, what's going down? I'm just trying to mm -hmm. catch up to speed with the, the dialogue here. Yes, that's correct. And we have actually already begun reaching out to some vendors, for example, to look at the floor, uh, the newly uh, renovated floor at um, LHS that, that's currently not uh, outfitted for the gymnastics equipment uh, to see what that cost would be. We also probably need to look at Free State as, as well. So we already begun to reach out to some folks to get some estimates. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. So we're still, still moving forward with it, potentially. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So there's no board action needed tonight, right? Yeah. And then um, will gymnastics happen next year That's is my other question. I know you mentioned safety considerations and then reaching out to Sunflower mm -hmm. partners to see if it's okay if we're not pulling our weight, if you will, with hosting. Yes. So what weight do those two considerations have on the overall decision on Gymnastics. Yeah, like I said, the safety issue for me was was the biggest concern because we had coaches and some other staff um, moving the equipment. But talking to one of the coaches, we believe we can find a, a workaround where the equipment is not moved uh, frequently. It's just kind of stationed in a in a room. But we need to have some other conversation with some folks that use that room. Uh, so that's the the number one concern for me. Uh, and then obviously the um, cost of you know if we do replace equipment. Uh, that would be a, the second piece for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, and I'll, let me say this. Um, also, obviously, with, with conversations with our athletic directors and coaches, really talking about the future of the program. Because what I would not want is for, um, if, if the program will be in existence, and we don't know this, you know, participation will impact this as well, for us to purchase brand new equipment and then three years down the road, we don't have a program for, for whatever reason, you know, low participation or, or whatever. So that's why I mentioned maybe looking at leasing um, a building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are doing it next year? Yes, we are doing it okay. next year. Okay. <laughs> so we are doing it next year. Yes. Is that? Okay. okay. Yes. And that will give us an opportunity to, to research some of this um, okay. Okay. farther. Thank you for that. All right. Any other questions for the board from the board until we move to public comment? None? Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Greg. You. Let's 
second. All right, it's cat barrel here, okay. Hi, um, whew, I had a whole thing prepared. There's not a lot to say right now. Um, that it's been a whirlwind um, since we were told back in December that we were canceled um, of emotions. But as a coach of a very successful gymnastics team, particularly in 2020, taking all gold, every single top spot plus more. Um, building that kind of a program takes time and it takes incredible coaches and staff and support from our families and at the most our athletes. They are incredible and they are why we have been here over and over and over. And I would just like to at some point, I hope somebody says sorry for putting them through it like this. It didn't have to be like this. That's what matters most to me. I have a life outside of gymnastics, but I make time because of these athletes, because of these students. The same reason that you guys fight are the same reasons that I fight. I love them. And they are amazing. And the students that we reach, we are a no-cut sport of females. And the only reason we're impacted other than COVID is because we don't have support. And we haven't had support. This is the first time since I started coaching over six years ago in this district, I came from club gymnastics. In this district, this is the first time I feel like someone is finally on our side, hears us and sees us. That has not happened before. And for the first time, people know what we've had to go through just to exist. So if you wanna know why numbers are waning, try looking at support and feeling like you care about us. That's all we need and they deserve it. Every single ounce of those girls pours into their sport and they are incredible. And you would know that if you came to a meet, if you saw what they did and you saw the space. We have equipment, we are ready to go. We are happy to go, tell us what to do. You didn't even ask us if we could find ways to fund ourselves, sponsorships, anything. So please, I say thank you for those who fought for us this entire time directly to you but I just, please ask, please don't ever make them feel like they aren't worth it ever again. Please don't ever do that to them again. Thank you for your comments. Next on the agenda is the Montessori School Report. And I will welcome Dr. Cynthia Johnson, Kristen Ryan, and Sunny Halstead. Good evening to the board. Good evening. It is so great to stand before you today to bring you a board proposal as it relates to a Montessori school at New York Elementary. My name is Dr. Cynthia Johnson. I am the Executive Director of Inclusion, Engagement, and Belonging. Pending board approval, the Lawrence Public Schools will begin a process to phase in offering a free public Montessori at New York Elementary School, beginning with the Children's House, ages three, four, and kindergarten in the fall of 2022, and the district plans to add lower elementary grades, one through three, and upper elementary grades, four through six, um, as the opportunities um, come in the future. So we will expand after this first year. The Montessori philosophy aligns with all five goals of our strategic plan. That includes cohesive curriculum, student-centered learning, safe and supportive schools, effective and committed employees, 
and data-informed decisions. Tonight, we have multiple <laughs> um, presenters because there are many people that make up what I call Team Montessori. It's not just one individual, it's not two individuals. It truly is a community to bring this um, forward. So let's pause for a moment and look at our why, if you will. Our why and purpose includes, first of all, our declining enrollment and our budget cuts that we are facilitating at this present time. Another why is that this is a unique opportunity, first of all, to offer programming to our students and our families in our community. It also is an opportunity to be the first free public Montessori in the state of Kansas. Also, another why is Dr. Maria Montessori in her brilliance as the first Italian physician, female physician, observed children and looked at their tendencies and how they went about learning, exploring, and from that developed the Montessori method. Another reason why and why we're looking at New York Elementary, because New York Elementary has the highest free and reduced lunch rate. Now, earlier I said that there are multiple people that make up Team Montessori. You will see the names on the screen. Later today, you'll, um, tonight, you'll hear from the KU Center for Montessori Research. The National um, Center for Montessori in the Public Sector is another partner. One of our um, partners that we are so honored to work with as Holiday Montessori in Kansas City Public Schools. We're also honored and thrilled right here in our own community to work with Rain Tree Montessori. Frank Vincent, who is a Montessori expert and who brought the first free Montessori schools in Kansas City Public Schools. And then also you'll hear tonight from Jennifer Baker Powers. So as you see, this is a team effort. So just quickly, let's look at what is Montessori? The Montessori philosophy recognizes the uniqueness of individuals and their different rates of development and varying patterns and abilities. The approach stresses the importance of allowing children to experiment. That's the beauty and the brilliance that Dr. Montessori brought to learn independently and progress at their own speed. Multi-age grouping encourages peer teaching and social interactions. Here in just a moment, I'm going to have Sunny Halstead, um, principal at New York Elementary, come to um, the podium. Before we do so, I talked about the honor of being able to work with Holiday Montessori. Well, on the screen, you have a picture of Principal Bass Bar Barlow. And the reason I have her there is that, first of all, she is a member of the AMI USA Board of Directors. We have been to visit her school and to see, if you will, the magic in action and the learning, the experimentation, um, that curiosity of the students, being able to observe that firsthand was very, very powerful. So at this time, Sunny Halstead is going to come and talk with you about different things that we've done to bring in community members. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, on our step to inform all of our stakeholders about Montessori and give some information, one of the things that we were able to do was to bring in staff from New York Elementary that was interested in being in the Montessori school. And so we invited staff and were able to Zoom with our um, partner at Holiday Montessori, um, Principal Bass Barlow, and three of her staff members took time out of their duty day to sit with our staff virtually and answer just any and every question that they had. Um, our executive leadership team was also there to answer some questions, um, to give some of our staff members a little better understanding and get in 
kind of the weeds of some of those questions that they were having around Montessori. So that was a great event that we were able to do for our staff. Um, the next thing that we were able to do last week were some dinner and discussions for our New York community. We um, had a great dinner um, provided by Lawrence Schools Foundation and 23rd Street Brewery, and then some desserts provided by our New York um, business partners, Altrusa and Connect Church. We had a great turnout both nights. Um, we had many of the people that you're going to hear from tonight were able to speak. We had a great time for um, parents and community members. It wasn't just parents. We had site council, PTA. We had community neighbors who live across the street, all, all sorts of people asking um, insightful questions that are helping us you know, on this journey to, to build this program. Um, so that was a great um, evening, two evenings. And we had uh, about 50 parents leave information for us, three, four, and five-year-olds. Actually, in fact, one as young as 15 months old that would like on the list. So um, it was a great turnout um, that we were able to um, provide for our community. Great. Thank you so much, Sunny, for highlighting our stakeholder input and involvement. Next, I want to um, draw your attention to our thought exchange. This is an opportunity to engage our participants and our family in our community. Um, our thought exchange question says, after hearing the discussion about Montessori education, what is top of mind for you as the district considers implementing a Montessori school at New York Elementary? So out of those 50 parents and community members that came, we had 18 participants utilize this process, and we have 63 ratings. And from those ratings, we want to draw your attention to the word cloud. The word cloud says very clearly that those people that have participated and also marked the other areas, that the program was very exciting, as well as parents that are hoping to be involved and to also to get their children. And Kristen Ryan is going to talk just a little bit more about that here in just a few minutes. That parents was another key word as well as the overall ideal of Montessori education. So at this time, Kristen Ryan is going to come bring you some of the key thoughts. Good evening. So yes, I'm going to just share some, we have four slides of just thoughts from that, those two evenings that our participants did share. You can tell off to the right the stars that are beside them, so they're the, the top thoughts. So I love the idea. I wonder if my kids will qualify. This is an excellent option for parents who want their children to learn and grow. I just hope my children will qualify for the program. So a thought of expanding across ages and neighborhoods and ensuring appropriate training for teachers. We need fully trained Montessori teachers to do this right. I love the idea. I wonder if my kids will qualify. Um, also, I'm hoping for expansion of the program to other schools. I think this is important to allow all families the opportunity for a different style of education. And then this slide shows how the age groups will be prioritized. So that was a question submitted. Will there be many more five-year-olds than three, four-year-olds? I would like to see more details ironed out when possible. Is it an all-day program? Will three and four-year-olds need to be at risk to attend? Both parents work full-time and we are not considered at risk. And then finally, the two thoughts hoping there will be enough room for families outside of the New York area and are enough teachers interested and in people from outside the district unsure if we should do this if it doesn't actually bring more students to the school or district. So good thoughts. Great. Thank you so much. As I said earlier, there are so many partners and um, people that are stepping in to help um, but not just to help, but to bring a unique um, perspective and expertise. So at this time, I would like to invite um, Jennifer Baker Powers to the podium, and she's going to take us inside the Montessori classroom. Well, I'm so excited for the opportunity to speak to you all. Just a little bit loud. Before I get started, I wanted to point out um, two things. Um, a number of those uh, chess champions are Montessori kids. 
So they bring that analytical background that they have. And then the second thing is there is no way that I could possibly explain the depth and breadth of Montessori education. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is just merely a thimbleful of what a Montessori education looks like. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Montessori classroom. Um, my name is Jennifer Baker Powers, and I have over 20 years of experience in a Montessori classroom. So for me, that means that the children who were in my very first classroom are now um, graduating and becoming um, chefs and mechanics and nurses and lawyers and whatever um, you know their lives paths brought to them. And I share that because I know that about these kids who are now 23 and 24 and 25 years old because during the time that they were in my classroom over a three-year period, I got to know them and we formed a really unique bond. I got to know their families and so we've continued to um, stay in contact and they share with me what they're doing um, in their lives. I get so many graduation announcements each year. So that's uh, Dr. Montessori. Obviously, later in her life, you can tell she really loved children. Um, Dr. Montessori was a scientist. She was um, the first female physician in Italy. And so the Montessori method is truly a practice that's rooted in science. Um, she tried to discover what, um, how children learned best. And you'll hear that even though the method is over 100 years old, it is still very much relevant today to what um, research, educational research is showing, what neuroscience is showing is still very relevant to how children learn best. And Dr. Murray will speak to that in just a bit. And then those are some of the first um, and classic Montessori materials. Um, I included this slide because this is one of the first Montessori classrooms. So in the United States, Montessori education has become um, kind of synonymous with private education or independent education. And so what that means is it's not free. It costs money. And it frequently costs a lot of money. Um, that was not the first group of children that Dr. Montessori worked with. She actually worked with what she called um, the children of the street. And so, you know, a hundred years ago in uh, stereotypical gender roles, the fathers were at work and the mothers were at home with the new babies. And, you know, the older elementary age children were at school. So there was this group of children, you know, ages three, four, and five, the preschool kids, who ran around in the streets. And so she started to observe that and took that in, took those kids in, and those became the students that she started working with, the children that nobody was educating. And so I think this is a really unique opportunity for our community, and I am so excited for the families of New York School to have this opportunity for this kind of thoughtful approach to education for free. And here's a little video um, from the Montessori Research Institute, and it kind of uh, highlights the critical components. So we'll look at this video and then we'll kind of unpack the, the words.
Okay, so let's talk about those things. Um, we'll do a little like day in the life of a Montessori student. So in a Montessori classroom, uh, you have a three hour uninterrupted work cycle. So the students arrive at the classroom, you know, they're greeted by their teacher, and they know that they have this block of work time, as the children call it. Work is a good word in a Montessori classroom, um, where they have freedom within limits to move around the prepared environment, which we'll talk about, to choose what they would like to work on. Um, they learn how to be self-directed. They choose their materials based on what they're interested in, where their developmental needs are. Um, and the lessons are given during this three-hour work cycle um, based on where the child is developmentally and not based on like chronological age. So children aren't grouped together like, okay, all the four-year-olds are gonna come over and have a presentation on this. It's based on the individual child. Um, the three hour uninterrupted work cycle allows for um, a period of intense learning and then a period of repose afterwards where the child processes and integrates the information, the new information that they've just taken in. And you know, that's how learning happens. Um, children may choose to work on something for as long as they would like. There's no one that comes over and says, okay, you've done enough math right now, now you should put the math away and get out your glue. The child decides how long they're going to stay with something, and that looks different. It looks different for each child, and it looks different each day, and it looks different depending on um, what the child is working on. So one common, uh, misconception that some people have about Montessori classrooms is that it's just a space where children go in and they get to do whatever they want, whenever they want, all the time. They just run amok and do whatever. Um, and that's actually not true. Dr. Montessori spoke a lot about freedom within boundaries. And that's one of the things that ch the children first learn to understand about a Montessori classroom is what they are free to do and when. Um, my favorite Montessori quote, not to be a Montessori dork, but is the river would never reach the sea were it not hemmed in by the banks. And I think that very accurately sums up um, what freedom with discipline looks like in a Montessori classroom. Um, Montessori classrooms are mixed aged, um, whether you're talking about the primary level or the children's house, lower elementary or upper elementary. And the reason that I think this is um, a vital component is because the children are, as I said before, receiving that one-on-one -on -one instruction based on um, what their needs are. So say you have a four-year-old who's really struggling to learn like their letter sounds, for instance. That Montessori teacher can keep working with that child and helping them as they grow and, and start to learn their letter sounds and get better at that instead of like, oh my gosh, all my other peers that are the same age are getting this. Why am I not understanding this? It's, it's individualized. The mixed age classrooms provide an opportunity for um, younger students to learn from older students. They can see, um, oh gosh, if I practice this, someday I'll get a lesson on that material. And the older students then get the opportunity to become the teachers. One of the, their favorite things to do is to present a lesson to a younger student. And we all know that the best way to show that you truly understand something is by teaching someone else. Um, I think this is really the crux of Montessori education, is that it is individualized instruction. And so um, the children receive what they call a lesson on the materials, the Montessori materials, they're very specialized materials. They're beautiful when you see them all set up in a classroom. They're just gorgeous. Um, so they receive these lessons one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. When the teacher sits down one-on-one -on -one with a student like that, they can really start to understand, okay, I think this student is getting the concepts I'm trying to teach to them, or no, I don't think that this child is understanding. Let me see if I can approach it a different way. So 
Montessori classrooms uh, tend to be larger in size, which is kind of funny because we talk about, oh, we want smaller class sizes. Um, but in a Montessori classroom, we like to have lots of children. Um, Maria Montessori had sometimes 60 children in a classroom by herself. Um, the reason that Montessorians think this is a good idea is because it promotes independence. Um, children, if they see that their teacher is working with others, um, they tend to go see if they can figure out a problem for themselves or ask a friend, what could I do? How could I solve this? Instead of always going to an adult to seek um, you know, remediation or to figure something out. When, one of the things that I always um, say to the children in my classroom when they ask me a question, I, I never try to answer it directly. I never try to give them the answer. I always say, hmm, and pause while they try to think of a way that they might figure, figure that out. Oh, we could go get a book, or we could go figure that, you know, see what that's about. Um, larger class sizes promote and support concentration, order, self-determination, and intrinsic motivation, and a sense of community. So um, a big term in Montessori education is the prepared environment. So if you walked into any Montessori classroom, any true Montessori classroom anywhere, it should look basically the same. There's going to be all these little touches based on you know, the individual teacher's style and decor and the school and all that. But there's the basic slate of Montessori materials um, in the four areas, which we will talk about. And um, each material is meant to highlight a skill. Montessori materials move from the simple to complex, and they move from the concrete to the abstract. So before a child would you know, um, be expected to just memorize a math fact, they would have experience with some kind of hands-on manipulative that says, you know, we can count, okay, two plus three, oh, I put that together and that equals five. They're touching that. And then as they work with those materials over time, they start to um, memorize and move those things into um, abstraction. One of the other things that's really unique about a Montessori classroom and the prepared environment is that the children care for this environment. They, part of the lesson is how you put it back on the shelf ready for the next person. And so, and everything has a spot, so every material always goes back to the same place prepared and ready for the next student. Okay, and then here is a little, another little video. Is this the one you want me to play? Okay, I think it's about four minutes long. Basically, a Montessori school is a school designed by Maria Montessori, who created the first Montessori school about 100 years ago. So it's very different from the traditional classroom. Children do not sit in one seat all day. They move around. They go. They choose act their own activities rather than having the teacher choose for them. And again, that's a key part of one of Maria Montessori's uh, observations: is that children internally they know what's important to them and they know what they need to do. For the CASA classroom, the class is divided from three to six-year-olds. Um, the lower elementary is six to nine-year-olds, and the upper elementary is nine to twelve-year-olds. And again, that, that, that works just beautifully because you have this age mix, and, uh, and over the course of the three years in the classroom, the children kind of progress to become that older brother and sister, and they're kind of helping everyone out and, and uh, becoming a real leader within the classroom. The teacher's not in charge. The teacher um, is a link to the classroom. We're a link to the environment and a link to the Montessori materials. We introduce the materials to the children. We call them lessons. Um, but we're not the only ones. It's, the whole class helps to run the whole environment. In a traditional Montessori school, there is no tests, no marks, no grades. Because quite often what the test does is gives this child a sense of, look at how much I don't know. We definitely don't, don't need the test at the young ages, but even at the older ages where the children are getting into uh, grades three, four, and five, and six, um, again, that's the, the teacher's role. The teacher's role is to figure out what this child knows and how well they know it. Um, children don't have a negative connotation of the word work. We do call it work in Montessori, but what is work? It is purposeful activities. 
Um, so they are free to choose, but they don't have complete freedom. It's freedom within limits if done properly. Uh, what a child gets from a Montessori environment is this love of learning. If they have a love of learning, they can move into any kind of environment at that point. They can go to a different kind of system of, of uh, education or, or traditional or public school, whatever it happens to be. And they usually adapt quite well because, again, what's hopefully instilled in them is I love to learn, I love to uh, work, I love to uh, educate myself. We see children who come back and visit and everyone seems happy and, and learning well as though they've been learning well and, and that they've adapted. Uh, something that we really encourage parents to do is to involve their children at home in what we call practical life. Having the children see you handwriting shopping lists or writing things out so that they can see you doing these activities then they will pick them up and know that that is real life living. To help build the child's uh, self-esteem and self-confidence and to get them involved and feel good about themselves, they need to be involved. They need to feel a part of the family. And we also know that all these activities, uh, um, you know, setting the table, shoveling, those are activities that really enhance a child's concentration, focus, uh, they develop their, um, their control and coordination, uh, and what ultimately comes out of it is they develop their self-discipline and their, and their will. By the time they get up to, uh, you know, teenage years, they're usually quite uh, self-sufficient and they can, you know, uh, do a lot of things on their own. One of the key concepts of Montessori is that um, Maria Montessori realized that children universally around the world, they develop in the same way, regardless of what country you're from or, or what nation you're from. Uh, every child is the same, and every child goes through these stages of development and, have, and has these certain needs at each stage. So based on that, Montessori, yes, it should be for every child, and uh, because, you know, every child should flourish within a, a Montessori classroom. Okay, so um, I could talk about this forever, but I'm going to try to pick up the pace just a little bit. Um, there are four areas in a Montessori classroom, and the first one is practical life. That's where children practices real life skills. It's where they learn to care for the environment. It's where they learn to care for themselves. It's where they build um, the skills of independence and order and concentration. Um, the practical life area is really the bedrock, the foundation for all other learning in the classroom. Um, there is an indirect preparation for later learning built into all of the practical life activities. So say a child is going to do, um, say, a scrubbing work or a polishing work. Um, they are reinforcing the pincer grip for writing by using these, the pincer grip to move around the little cotton ball. They're laying their materials out from left to right, which is, and then using the materials from left to right, indirect preparation for how we um, read and write in this country. Um, they do all kinds of things, pouring, washing windows, flower arranging, um, those kinds of practical life skills. The th same things they see their adults doing. Um, the sensorial area is um, where the children start to um, kind of clarify their thoughts on the sensorial world. We all move through um, our experiences exploring the world in a tactile way, a visual way, a, an um, auditory way. But as adults, we don't really think about the fact that we don't have, or children don't have labels or names for those concepts. You know, we as adults understand thick and thin, or that this is thick, but this is thicker than that. And so in the sensorial um, area and with the sensorial materials, they start to um, place labels and vocabulary with those sensorial experiences. And then they grow to appreciate those things more through those um, impressions. The math area is super amazing. Um, the materials, again, they move from simple to complex, concrete to abstract. Children are first introduced to quantity, like, okay, this is five, I can count five. And then they're introduced to the symbol, okay, I can count five, now this is what five looks like. And then they learn how to put the quantity and the symbol together, and then utilize them in mathematical operations, including the decimal system. 
And then the language area. M uh, Montessori uses a phonetic-based approach, and much like math, they are first introduced to the sounds in isolation. The sounds of letters is how they hear them. And then they're introduced, okay, I said this is what you know, mm sounds like, this is what mm looks like. And so then they put the sound and the symbol together, and then they start to um, learn how to build words, and then build sentences, and then how to read the written impressions of others, all through a phonetic approach. Um, Montessori is very much about the process and not the product. So Montessori kids don't come home with a bunch of worksheets. They may not even come home with really any evidence of what they did during the day at school. They could have a very, very, very full day doing all kinds of things, learning all kinds of stuff, but not come home with anything to prove it to the parents. It's very much about the process because adults, we work to get things done. Children work for the love of working. I can't tell you how many times I have watched a child who's washing windows spray the window and squeegee the window down and then scrub, you know, dry it all off and then step back and look at it and think, ooh, yeah, that's a pretty window. I did good. And then they spray the window and then they squeegee it. Then they dry it off and then they step back and look at it again because they're working for the love of working, the joy that it brings them in the process and not to get something done the way adults work. Mm -hmm. okay. We're done. Sure. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thank you. As we said, we have experts that have come to the table to um, assist us in this process. This video that we have here, we're not going to show it tonight. However, we are going to attach it in the um, weekly update you can see the transition that um, South Carolina went from um, a public school to a public Montessori. So let's see if I can. Lot of okay, there we go. All right. At this time, we'd like to invite um, Dr. Angela Murray um, to the podium. Um, Dr. Murray, um, in just in a short time of, of knowing her and meeting her, um, I can guarantee you that she is going to um, hold us accountable for what we have said and monitor us along the way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for your, I, I love to see the intent eyes on the videos watching the kids in the classrooms because that's really the best way to get a sense of what happens in a Montessori classroom. So my goal this evening, and don't be concerned, it's getting late in the evening. I do teach statistics, but I'm not going to be reporting any statistics to you this evening. Um, there's a lot of research in Montessori education. I'm happy to share um, articles with you and things like that. What I'm trying to do with the time that I have with you is to really connect some of the practices that Jennifer spoke about to what we are learning in the literature and what we're learning in the field of research about Montessori education. Um, so as I was introduced, I am the uh, director for the Center for Montessori Research at the University of Kansas. I'm an assistant research professor there. Um, in part of the work that I do, I just want to give you a sense of how connected we are with the broader Montessori community nationally and internationally. Um, we collaborate at the Center for Montessori Research with the two national Montessori organizations in the U.S., um, which is the American Montessori Society and the Association Montessori International USA. Um, also, we collaborate with the International Montessori Organization, which is AMI. Um, we've collaborated with the National Center for Montessori in the Public Sector, as well as the Montessori Public Policy Initiative. Um, and I am just coming off today from a presentation with the American Educational Research Association um, Montessori uh, Special Interest Group. So there's a, a broad network of folks working not just on Montessori nationally, but on public Montessori nationally. To give you a sense of that, um, this is a screen grab from the um, Montessori Census hosted by the, Mon the uh, National Center for Montessori in the Public Sector. While there are over 2,000 um, private Montessori programs in the U.S., there are 565 public programs. So if you look at the map, the map shows where those public programs are, and you can see that there are concentrations of schools on the coasts. 
Um, in particular, you might notice the large number of schools in California. There are a large number of schools in um, Texas. South Carolina has a statewide Montessori program. Um, but what you will also notice is that right there in the middle of the country, there's not a lot of public Montessori. There's not a public Montessori school in the state of Kansas, although there are two thriving Montessori public schools in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, that, that the photos from the video that you saw from our center that had the characteristics of Montessori education, those photos were taken by Jennifer Baker Powers at Holiday Montessori, um, so that those, those were kiddos that were right close by. So to also give you an idea of what's happening nationally with Montes and internationally with Montessori research, um, work that we're doing in relation to the Montessori movement at the Center for Montessori Research, we have been hosting um, the Journal of Montessori Research at KU since 2015. Um, I'm the editor of that journal and we've had two issues a year, uh, every year since we launched it, even during the pandemic, which I'm quite proud of. Um, a lot of research kind of came to a screeching halt during the pandemic. Um, and then we're also working on a handbook of Montessori education. I'm the lead editor for this publication that's going to be published by Bloomsbury Publishing in the UK. Um, our deadline for submitting this document or this manuscript is the end of the week or the end of the month, so um, if you see a little bags under my eyes, that's why. Um, but the great thing about that volume is that it's given me an opportunity as I edit the research section of that volume to really know what the leading scholars in the field are talking about related to Montessori education today. So I'm giving you a little bit of an off the record, but not really off the record, preview of, of what's in that um, handbook. So I organize the topics that I want to talk about around five of the, the topics that are covered in that handbook. Um, academics and pre-academics, these are areas where we have um, research going on and where I can really show you connections to Montessori practices. So we'll look at um, academics and pre-academics, creativity, executive functions, neuroscience, and motivation. Um, and there are some researchers within each one of those um, topic areas that I can point you to if there's an interest. And this presentation does have a bibliography at the end, um, but I'm also happy to point you to any particular studies that you might be interested in. So in looking at the academic pre-academics, uh, this is sort of the, the question I get asked as a Montessori researcher all the time, which is, okay, great, but does it work, right? So that's the question. Um, so that's really an area where quite a bit of research is happening. And what I've done in the way I've laid these slides out is you can see the connected practices on those um, image, underneath those images on the left-hand side of the screen. And then I summarize some of the key outcomes in that blue box underneath the icon. So when we look at academic and pre-academics, we look at things that are happening in the Montessori classroom, like what we call embodied cognition. Those manipulatives where students are tracing letters, that's using their bodies to, um, to um, understand concepts. We know that much of the phonetic learning um, that's happening in reading in a Montessori classroom is a aligned with current science of reading um, uh, concepts. And also students in the Montessori classroom learn writing before they read. So they're able to construct words with those alphabetical letters that they're working on. In terms of math, um, best practices in math manipulatives are really reflected in Montessori classrooms. Some of those materials that Jennifer spoke about, talking about that concrete to abstract progression. These things that are happening are showing evidence of success in the research literature. So we see that across studies um, and across countries and settings, um, superior and increasing academic um, performance for Montessori kids. In particular, what we see is that over time, performance tends to um, accelerate for the kids that are in Montessori classrooms. Um, we find that pro programs that are higher fidelity, that have, have, have the materials and the trained teachers, tend to produce stronger results. But one of the things that I keyed in on when I heard folks speaking earlier this evening is some of the research that we have that's suggesting that Montessori education can shrink some of the, the gaps that we typically see in groups that are disadvantaged. And so um, that's some pretty exciting research that's beginning to come out to show that um, for lower socioeconomic um, groups, as well as for children of color, that there are some strong results that we're we'll seeing in the, the results, particularly for Latinx students. In terms of creativity, um, creativity is one of those areas that Montessori does not directly teach. 
Montessori is not known as having a particular arts focus or an emphasis on pretend play. Um, but the, or, the classroom environment is playful. And the design of the Montessori curriculum builds resources within children that support creative, um, creative development. So we see that things like this socio-cognitive environment that is the Montessori classroom, providing those skills, supporting personal initiative, and answering their own questions, as Jennifer described it, really create the initiative that leads to creativity. So what we see in the, re the research is that Montessori kids show stronger results on both divergent and convergent creativity. Um, we can identify more highly creative students, among, or highly creative Montessori students when they're compared to more traditionally educated students. They develop novel and context appropriate um, ideas in their creativity. So um, it's a demonstration of how fostering that environment can really create um, opportunities for students to be creative and have initiative on their own. Executive functioning, there, there are several aspects of sort of cognitive development that are really important in research right now. Um, what happens in a Montessori classroom, I, I will be completely honest with you, the results on executive functioning are a little mixed. But I ask you, imagine measuring executive functioning of a three-year-old. Right, it's a little tough to find instruments that work well with that age group. One of the ways they do it is, you know, the head, shoulders, knees, and toes game. Um, they do that with kiddos, but they say, when I say touch your head, touch your toes. When I say touch your shoulders, touch your knees. So anyway, th those are some of the creative ways they try to assess executive functioning. Um, we see studies that suggest positive outcomes in terms of cognitive flexibility, working memory, reduced impulsivity, fewer errors, and a growth of self-regulation. But what's really the big key to Montessori and executive functioning is the, the theoretical alignment. When you have an environment that offers children the opportunity for regularly practicing executive functioning in the classroom, practicing self-control um, throughout the day by having um, choice in their activities, having to devote concentration to their activities, being exposed to those sensorial materials, being able to move in the classroom, and that active hands-on learning, all of those things really work together to support executive functioning. I will point out one thing for you. That photo on the left-hand side is a child cutting up what I think is an apple, um, but I don't know if you can see that there is a little, a little strip of paper, and that's a scaffold. That strip of paper is basically showing the child, here's the steps to go through for cutting up this apple. The child doesn't need the teacher hovering over them or a whole group of children cutting up apples together step by step. The children, is, the children are given the tools to independently execute that activity. And food preparation is a big part of practical life that Jennifer mentioned earlier. Neuroscience, that's the, a, a chapter that I'm just editing right now. Um, and what's really amazing is that what Montessori observed when she watched children work is those, those theories that she developed were re, are really being borne out in the neuroscience right now. In, in some of the tools that we have today that she could have only dreamed about, we're seeing evidence of the cognitive processes that she believed were happening as she observed children learning. So there are activities in the classroom that are primarily self-correcting so that children don't need an adult to come and tell them if they've done it correctly or not. The materials themselves have what we researchers and evaluators call embedded assessment. The assessment is built into the material. So that one that you're looking at right there is a knobbed cylinder. It's a series of cylinders in graduating sizes. And the children take all of the cylinders out and mix them up and then put them back in the block. But you know what? They know if they've done it right or not because when they get to the end, every peg has a spot. Not like when my husband works on a car and he has a leftover bolt and doesn't quite know where it belongs, right? So the child can tell and the child can say, oh, I can correct that. I've made a mistake, but I can fix it. I am powerful. I am empowered. I can fix my mistake. And so there's less, um, this control of error leads to less teacher-pleasing behavior. Children work for the joy of doing it and for the satisfaction of doing it. Um, also in neuroscience, in that idea of process over product, those kinds of things lead to 
the positive impacts of the mixed age classroom. That's what the, so the socio-emotional skills really are fostered in that mixed age classroom. So what we're seeing in the neuroscience literature is that young children at, who have been in a Montessori environment are able at a younger age to self-correct. They're more willing to take risks that do don't get scared. That doesn't mean they're gonna go jump off you know, the highest slide on the playground like my son used to do. Um, we know that we learn from mistakes, but in many environments, kids learn b making a mistake is bad, and so I'm not, a I'm not willing to take a risk and stretch myself and stretch my abilities beyond my current level because I'm afraid of the um, emotional impact of making a mistake. So Montessori kids show less emotional affect um, in making a mistake, and they're more willing to self-correct those mistakes. We also see evidence of enriched and denser semantic memory and more flexible thinking based on the cognitive science literature. And then finally, motivation. Motivation is really what drew me to Montessori because the idea of creating an environment where children want to learn, they're enthusiastic about learning, and they're curious and seeking out um, opportunities. And what we find is that self-determined engagement in a Montessori classroom, that choice with the teacher serving as a guide, leads to an, uh, an orientation that more Montessori children tend to have what we call a mastery orientation, um, which is this idea of being willing to do hard things. Um, they also report liking school better in some of the studies that we've looked at, um, and there's a good theoretical alignment between Montessori practices and the motivation literature. This and executive functioning are the two areas that I think have the most promise going forward, where the results are a little mixed yet or limited yet, um, but there's a lot of important work happening here. That idea of being able to foster that intrinsic motivation where the child can follow their own interests and have that autonomy is really showing some powerful um, preliminary results. So I just want to close by saying that um, I am excited to be able to bring to you this really high-level overview of Montessori research. I think it's exciting to see this type of program created in the Lawrence community. I've connected the folks on the team to some of the national efforts at expanding Montessori public programs and including some of the challenges that, that go along with that um, because we have some, some great folks around the country that are really working to make Montessori more accessible. Um, and so I'm excited to have the opportunity to share this with you, and I'm happy to answer questions at some point if that's appropriate. Uh, Dr. Murray, you, this is a quick question. You mentioned that you had a bibliography, but I don't think it actually is included in the... Okay, uh, we can make you, sure it gets yeah, to you. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. That was one of my comments I was making. I took that slide <laughs> out, but I won't go you back and definitely um, add that in. Now I'd like to invite Samantha Saltz um, to bring us a perspective from a New York elementary teacher. Hi. Samantha, I've been here before, probably recognize me. Um, I teach first grade at New York. It's actually my 12th year there. But before I came to Lawrence, I taught in a nonprofit Montessori preschool. And when I did that, and I transitioned coming out here for my boyfriend at the time, husband now, um, I looked really hard for a program to teach Montessori preschool here in the state of Kansas. And unfortunately, I couldn't find any that aligned with my values. And one of the core beliefs I have about Montessori education is that it's free and public. So to find this out <laughs> was really exciting for me personally. I've spent 12 years at New York writing grants to get Montessori materials and philosophies into my first grade classroom. And so I know the impact that it can have on students and families. I know people several board members have visited my classroom um, over the years and they say, you know, there's just something oh special about your classroom. And it's taken me a long time to really articulate what it is and I think it's just Montessori philosophy. I don't think it's anything I'm doing that's me. I think it's the things I've learned through Montessori. And I think that's what that little bit of magic is when you see those kids and their independence and their ability to co-teach with me or teach a group alongside me or teach their, we have coaches in my classroom. And they really love that honor. Um, we have tidy tasks, things, little tiny pieces of the Montessori philosophy are as embedded as I can in our, in our public education system. And I think they're what makes my class just a little bit different than a traditional setting. 
I brought with me today, well, I actually didn't bring them, Kinsley brought them, some Montessori materials, and I don't know if I want, like, I'll pass them up, but I have the gold beads for you that I just thought you might want to put your hands on. They're for teaching quantity, right, the idea of how much something is, so I'll pass those, and then the sandpaper letters. I know you've been here a very long time tonight, so I won't take up too much more time, but I do want to say that beyond my personal excitement, I also live two blocks away from the school, so I'm neighbors with my students, I'm neighbors with my families, I'm neighbors, I'm a part of ELNA, you know, those are organizations in which I participate in, and the excitement, you can feel it, and you can hear it, and the amount of people truly excited for it the idea that our school could get that special thing. New York doesn't always get the special thing, <laughs> you know? Um, we're usually a little forgotten in the corner, but I think our community is really excited for it, at least um, the ones that I've talked to. So that's my perspective. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fan club back there. This is really exciting. Um, and we know that we have loaded you up with information today. This was not, a strategic plan update. This is a program proposal. So we knew that we had to come in and, if you will, build a case for you to be able to um, see it from our perspective. So one of the things that we, that we added is um, this frequently asked questions section. We're going to do, I've got the team back here. I mean, it's going to be speed um, <laughs> questions that we're going through. To, to be able to communicate to you, but also to, to communicate to those who are watching some of the most frequent questions that keep coming up for us as we um, continue this journey. So I'm bringing to the podium right now, Ms. Cindy Fricks, who is the Executive um, Director of um, Finance. Good evening. Uh, tonight we'd like to talk about the cost of the Montessori program as in terms of the classroom materials and furniture. We've gotten quotes that that would run approximately 8,800 per classroom. So if we did two classrooms, we'd be looking at 17,500 and potentially um, using capital outlay for this. The other significant cost of the program is training um, in terms of bringing in teachers that are both Montessori certified and have hold a Kansas license. So that's a little bit of an interesting blend in this scenario. And so one option would be for the board to hire Montessori certified teachers um, that are already trained and we would just need to help them um, with the Kansas licensing process. That cost about 7,500 per person. The other option would be to hire Kansas certified teachers, but then provide the Montessori training. The training is held in Kansas City at this point, the most, the most nearby one, for $17,000. It takes essentially a school year to get trained, Monday through Friday, from September till spring. Um, and then if we paid that teacher's salary while they were going, to get trained would be an average of $65,000. And so in looking at the training, the Lawrence Schools Foundation has, has offered to um, help pay for that, but the teacher's salary would be part of the general fund. So one thing to think about would just be which, combination, which option or combination of options um, the board would like to, to utilize for this. Another very important question is who will teach the Montessori class, classes and definitely we would have professionally trained Montessori teachers guiding the children through the curriculum and that those teachers would be trained through AMI or AMS that Dr. Murray definitely talked about in terms of their collaboration at the Center of KU for Research. Just before the boarding meeting started, I received um, information from um, Principal Bass Barlow regarding the training. Um, the first informational meeting will take place on May 5th at 4 p.m. virtually to give us details of what the training will look like. Um, there's like a 60-40 split 
um, that we'll find more about. There's a certain amount of hours that have to be met and that training um, and that information came out um, today. Um, the, um, how will the Montessori classrooms be monitored? You see that I have Dr. Angela Murray's name on this slide. She didn't know that I was putting that on there, <laughs> but she is going to hold us accountable every step of the way as it relates to Montessori um, education. So we'll do a frequent frequent um, fidelity checks um, by, uh, with, along with um, Dr. Murray, administration, and other thought par partners, and document it using a fidelity checklist. We are also going to take the, the um, components of Montessori education, and we're going to put it into a walkthrough format um, in our DigiCoach, and I'll be working and partnering with um, Leah Wisdom to do that process. So we've talked about our excitement around this, and so we need to talk about numbers. Um, and as we look at two classrooms, unfortunately, like Dr. Montessori, we cannot stuff 60 kids into a classroom per state guidelines. So we're looking at a 10 to 1 um, ratio. And so these are current numbers that we're looking at right now. Um, New York will have its um, kindergarten orientation on Wednesday, so some of those five-year-old numbers may fluctuate. Um, currently, we don't have any requests to leave New York, even though it's Mon the Montessori proposal is coming, so that may change. Um, but that's where we're kind of sitting right now um, with numbers. And then as how students will be selected. With such an interest, we really had to think through this. Um, priority will always go to our New York students in the boundary. Um, priority one for five-year-olds, those entering kindergarten. Priority two, um, those four-year-olds that meet the at-risk um, criteria, and then followed by three-year-olds with the at-risk cr criteria, and then finally three and four-year-olds with full pay option. Um, so one of the questions we've um, really been asked about is what does the day look like for a student? And Jenny talked about the three-hour um, uninterrupted work cycle. So in working with um, the principal at Holiday Montessori, just kind of looking at their schedule and what we currently do. So here's kind of just a mock-up sample schedule that we might use. Obviously the times you know, may change to fit our master schedule. We will have first through fifth still in a traditional schedule. Um, but if you look there in the morning, they start with their AM work cycle with breakfast in the classroom. It's very important that the students are involved in that um, prep for breakfast. Um, and then they have lunch in the classroom and then some recess time, that specials time, and we'll talk about that in a second, which is that teacher plan time per our negotiated agreement. Um, and then in the afternoon, that kindergarten PM work cycle where the three and fours take a little bit of a nap and then a dismissal at the end of the day. So our regular schedule. Um, the before and after school question we've been getting a lot. New York does not offer before school. We are an early start school, and so we only have Boys and Girls Club after school. Their license um, starts with five-year-olds, so there would be no care for the three and four-year-olds. And then the question about specials, do the students get that art, music, PE, and library as in our traditional setting? The answer is yes. Um, that will still be offered. Um, easily in the schedule that we have now. And then Title I services, New York is a Title I school, and so we want to make sure that those students are still able to utilize those resources. Um, currently, we use a push-in model at New York, and so we would continue to do that. If this proposal was approved, um, I have a meeting next week with my intervention staff, and we will be discussing how that might look and then planning a trip to Holiday uh, Montessori to observe and collaborate with their intervention staff. And then special education services, um, I think you heard early in the presentation about the individualized nature of Montessori, and so that fits um, very well with those students who might qualify for individualized education services under special education. The next question, the next question, can a family request to transfer to attend? So families living outside of the New York school attendance area may apply for a transfer to New York for their kindergartner, kindergartner and elementary siblings. And the transfer form is located on our school district website and it's under transfers. And the district does consider transfer requests on a first come first serve basis as space is available and we do not provide transportation with a transfer and the transfer requests are due May 1st. 
And then if my family wants to enroll in a traditional classroom environment, so if New York school families choosing a traditional classroom environment may apply for a transfer to Cordley Elementary for their kindergartner. All right, we are down to the last slide. As we transition New York Elementary into a Montessori, based upon your vote tonight, here are the next immediate steps that we will take. First of all, we will focus on hiring Montessori teachers that are trained. We will um, focus on ordering uh, materials. Um, Cindy Frick will be involved with that, Paula Murish. Um, is already on top of, as, as always, when it comes to furniture and placement within our buildings, she is already on top of this, what it looks like, what it sounds like, and where it goes from there. Um, constant communication with our parents. Um, this will be huge in our family engagement piece to be able to communicate and have that two-way communication. Um, Fine-tuning our enrollment and transfer process, that's going to be a big um, topic as well. Our professional development, um, we're so fortunate to be able to have Samantha that already has um, some experience um, as being that classroom assistant. Um, you know, so we're, we're very excited about being able to bring um, training for that second person that will be in those classrooms. And then setting up the children's house. Um, I believe Jennifer talked about how beautiful and how gorgeous the, the actual process is, and as well as the environment. And then um, the plan for development of adding additional students each year um, till we get to grade six. So at this time, we're opening up for questions. I would ask Dr. Murray and Angela to come over, Angela, Jennifer to come um, join us up here. We'll come close. If you have questions, we'll get it out to you quickly. I appreciate the information here. It's really exciting. It's, it's a lot. It is yeah. a lot. So board, questions, comments, feedback? Uh, uh, this is Carol. I, I love your enthusiasm, I, I, and I love this presentation, and I'm excited about the possibility of Mont free Montessori, Montessori school here in Lawrence. But um, my question is, um, and I can see where this can attract teachers in the future, so that's really exciting. But I would like to know how the salaries compare from Montessori school teachers to just the regular. So, I mean, this is a great value, so I just, I just would like to know. Thank you. So I, I don't have data, so I hesitate. But what I understand is that um, it's not like Montessori teachers demand a much higher salary than other types of teachers do. I think that's my understanding. Right. It just seems like something that would be in high demand. I'm, I'm excited. It, it, it is, and that's why this teacher training piece is so key. And that I mean, when we first started talking about this as an idea, I kept saying, a teacher pipeline, teacher training, a credentialed teachers, that's really an important consideration. So yes, I think staying on top of that and staying ahead of where you want to be in terms of the next year that you want to have um, children enrolled, that's really going to be important. And at what Holiday does that's great is they take their classroom assistants mm -hmm. and they get inspired and then they, they fund those assistants to be able to get fully trained down the road. So that has created a real pipeline for them. I, I peeked at your holiday uh, website on the, the Kansas City Public Schools website, and I saw the littles with their violins and T-shirts. Can you? Can you they do have a that? strings program there. They do. Yeah. That's one of their wow. specials is the strings program there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the board? Okay. I can say something about the, about the salary. Um, so, like I said in the beginning, I've been a Montessori teacher for over 20 years, and I have never made $65,000 a year. Shannon was going to go first. Okay, go ahead, Shannon. Dr. Murray, um, uh, so I was taking a look at your slide of uh, public Montessori programs across the U.S. Um, would you be able to provide and follow up a, a, a list of a handful to look at that are not charter schools? Yeah, there are some, the, several large districts have, uh, Milwaukee is one that has okay. their magnet schools like Kansas City, Missouri. Um, Hartford, Connecticut is another one that has district schools that are Montessori schools. And I can give you a, a, a listing of more of those. And if you know of any that um, have transitioned 
in that in that universe that have transitioned recently, it would be helpful. I would like to just do a little bit of outside reading. Yeah, let um, me talk to some of my contacts okay. to see who might have done that recently. I will say that the video that we skipped was a beautiful discussion of how <laughs> and I will watch it South later. Carolina okay. took a, a traditional school and transitioned it okay. to a Montessori yeah. school. Yeah. Um, and um, Erica, if I could just. Did you, did you mention Connecticut? So, yes, Hartford, Connecticut is another one where there's significant. And Austin, and uh, Austin may be charter. Um, Houston, I think, is another one that has okay. a good bit right. of districts. When we are done with this report, I have an announcement um, or some information I want to share with the board, too. Yeah. So, thanks. Okay. Okay. okay, awesome. So um, I had a couple of uh, questions. Um, so the first one I had... Uh, uh, is in regards to uh, right now we give prior, uh, we're looking at giving priority to New York families. Uh, what happens if uh, in the future we look at potential border shifts or um, and then I was thinking about like you know New York families, East Side families. We have um, um, it's north of uh, north of 19th, south of Harper. Um, there is um, a mobile home. Uh, area over there that's currently um, over in uh, Perry Park. And so I was kind of curious, like, you know, um, why essentially New York and we might be leaving out some of that, that little pocket that's over there. So that's a more technical question, but I think it's relative, uh, relative to um, if we are wanting to reach, get students, uh, you got me. Okay. Yeah. Got and, it. And I, and I want to point out that's one of the things that I've talked with the, everyone about is how important it is to make sure that the school that's designed to serve kids that have historically been disadvantaged don't get pushed out by, by active parents who may not be in a position to need that kind of support. And so I love the idea of not just saying, is it New York? or the district, maybe there's tiers, maybe there's a satellite, there's like the New York boundary and then just outside of the New York boundary is the second priority rather than taking the entire district. Because what happened, yeah, so I, I love that idea and that may be a way of thinking about those areas that are not initially in the New York dist, uh, catchment area but might be fitting the, the population you're wanting to serve. Yeah. I'm gonna add to that, um, based upon our pre-pandemic data, New York Elementary's um, free and reduced lunch rate was 63.3. So that's why we started with that area. They had the highest level of free and reduced lunches. Mm -hmm. I think now it's 75. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was pre that was pre-pandemic. Um, and then the other question that I, th I think this is more one of those frequently asked questions. Uh, my student doesn't have Mont Montessori experience, like like a family asking this question, um, and they're wanting to come in kindergarten. Do they have to have that prior Montessori experience? If I didn't, I wasn't able to access it in uh, three or four year old. Um, we've talked a lot about that, so um, children can figure it out. They'll learn, especially if they're in a well supported environment. Um, that was a question that I asked at one of our, um, you know, meetings about would priority be given to students who have Montessori experience, you know, kids who've gone to, say, you know, a private uh, Montessori preschool in town, but now here there's this opportunity for public Montessori kindergarten. And the answer is no, because, um, as somebody put it, then that... Uh, takes the opportunity away from those students who haven't had Montessori experience because they weren't in a tuition-based private or independent school program. And so one of the other um, people involved in, in the thinking about this said that, you know, there'll be bumps along the way as, you know, this is figured out. And where you end up is not where you start. And so I think in answer to your question, no priority will not be given to students who have previous Montessori experience and the kids will be flexible and they'll figure it out together with their teachers who really know what they're doing. I think that answer really helps families. Yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, um, I have a couple. With, I'm gonna start with the special education and then I have some questions around funding. The, um, and what am I on? Why cordly? Um, okay, so 
with special education, uh, I, I understand how when you're talking about how you would incorporate them into the classroom, um, there would be this more individualized approach to service. But what uh, is there any research related to delayed identification of special education because you don't have what we typically use to identify a child who has special education needs? So with special education, uh, as a public school, we have requirements, and it follows that same process. So it'll be an IEP process, work with parents, work with teams. The understanding is that as we develop IEPs, it's based on their environment. So the students are getting support they need based on the environment, and that could change whether they're in a Montessori school or in a different school, and they work with our, we'll work with our early childhood special education team. I'm actually wondering if there's a, a delay in identifying a child has special education needs based on, it sounds like there is not any research around that or any concern for that. And, and it's based on that referral process because okay. we have a child find how we, whether it's coming from outside or inside. And I think when that you look sense. at data, I think interventions and you're looking at where students are, that process still works. Th thank you. May I say something? May I, say something? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think that there's actually the, the, the method allows for earlier identification because um, the teacher is working individually with that student. And so instead of, you know, teaching to the group where a four-year-old, you know, they're clever, they might be able to kind of figure out how to avoid the question or to hide behind the answers of an, a peer. Um, so when you're working one-on-one -on -one with students, um, my experience has been, and with the Montessori educators that I have collaborated with and worked with, I think we identify students earlier because of the individualized education approach. Is there research around that? Or is that an inference? Not that I'm okay, thank you. That is definitely an inference on my part okay. from experience. <laughs> thank you. Kelly, would you mind if I, I would like to invite, come up, Kinsley, just for a moment. I'd like to invite um, Kinsley Williamson. She came along with us last Tuesday and Thursday. She is a trained um, Montessori teacher. When you're back there answering her questions, she's she was shaking her head, so, so come on. So. Um, I, um, especially with the special education, um, I fully agree with Jennifer um, that we identify children earlier in my experience of eight years um, being fully certified and in the classroom. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I, I would like to understand from district staff why we would only uh, let transfers into Cordley if, there are, if there's room in another, another building um, and why we wouldn't let students into Woodlawn, for example, where we have, a, a, a decree, we have an enrollment issue there. Yeah, we looked at several schools, and they were all anywhere between 1.3 to 1.7 miles. Corley was right there in the middle, at 1.5 uh -huh. miles from there. Um, and so that's the one we was comfortable um, recommending. And we probably won't need to transfer anybody anywhere because we haven't had any interest in okay. transferring. I, I, I says, as somebody that lives in that neighborhood, um, and who I, I would not see an issue if a parent had a preference for Woodlawn versus Cordley to open up that transfer process as we would in prior years. So I'd be interested in that, but I'm not hung up on it. Um, and then Erica, I'll stop. I have another question about funding, but I want to make space for other people. Thank you. Questions? Yes, definitely. Um, thank you, Kelly, for asking the question about Cordy. I also have that question. That's something I want us to keep at least being aware of and thinking about. But I kind of have two different types of questions, more like the philosophical theory world viewing with Jennifer and um, Dr. Murray, and then more like a, applied practice, right? And then transition the institutional practices from district admin. So um, I'm real excited about the possibility of free public Montessori. I have a background in consulting with Raintree and back east. Um, and you presented so many positives. I appreciate it. At one point you said I could also talk about challenges. Could you also talk to us about some of the challenges that could potentially come our way so we can be aware of those in terms of a public Montessori elementary school? 
So I think one of the challenges is recognizing how this fits into some of the state assessment timetables. Um, Montessori kids tend to do well in assessments, but the, the timing with, in which they are exposed to particular information doesn't necessarily line up exactly with um, the state's assessments. That's where this connection to holiday is going to be key because they have experience with really helping the Montessori classroom teachers um, cover the standards in a Montessori way. And so I know that's a very um, a challenging thing that they do, but they have figured out a way to do it and do it well. So I think that's one of the big, the big challenges is, is sort of the living in a world with the expectations that align with traditional environments and putting something that's not traditional in that um, and figuring out how to make that work. Um, but we have a great role model in Holiday, I think, to, to follow, so. Absolutely, the, another challenge, and I actually hired uh, Principal Bass Barlow to do the amazing transformation work that you did at, at Holiday. Um, and so having supervised those two Montessori schools in Kansas City, Border Star and Holiday, those challenges were, um, you had some true Montessori and teachers there, and then we were, in the, we were on the verge of going to one-to-one -to -one initiatives. Well, you won't see a lot of technology in Montessori classrooms, so they found a way to still allow the, particularly the older students, to use them for research. I think um, uh, Ms. Basketball has used them a little differently now. The other piece of that is after probably maybe fourth or fifth grade, um, I think then we went up to sixth grade in elementary, um, those kids scored a lot higher than some of our traditional schools. The other challenge is, and I think it was mentioned tonight, is that pipeline of trained Montessori teachers. Um, there was one time we had a lot of, you know, some frequent retirements and we were trying to make sure that we um, had a pipeline of, of teachers. And so that's something we want to go into this, being intentional about making sure we have those trained Montessori teachers. Because as Dr. Murray said, the research supports if, if and I wrote it down, Dr. Murray, uh, high, higher fidelity of um, programs show stronger results. And so part of, the, part of that is making sure we have trained Montessori teachers. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. You, in fact, helped transition perfectly some more of those functional questions I asked. I was going to ask about one-on-one, -on -one, one-to-one devices, right, and what that looks like. Um, I know you, in the um, presentation, mentioned um, starting with a um, certified Montessori teacher. I love that. What about current teachers then um, at New York that aren't certified? If they're interested, what does that look like? If they aren't interested, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. You can come on, but I can start. Uh, we have some that are interested. Um, <laughs> looking at one of them. Um, we have some that are interested at New York and a couple of other schools that are interested. And so, again, that cost you saw on the screen in terms of, um, and here's the thing, we have a unique opportunity to have access to training that's 45 minutes away. Typically, you have to send people on a plane for two or three summers in a row, pay their daily rate, pay their lodging, pay their food, and the price could be enormous. So to have this opportunity is really unique um, for us. So those teachers that are not interested, then we will definitely um, offer transfer opportunities for them. I'll let Kristen chime in. We would um, go through the transfer process. So in terms of the rotation of when that would come up, in terms of starting small with the two teachers. And also we did a survey a, a couple, maybe a couple months ago, in just interest of district current district staff that are interested. And we had over 25 staff that were interested in potentially getting trained. So there, there was a high interest level of just, yes, I'm interested and I want to know more. And then there's some very serious people, staff, that are very interested as well. Thank you. And I have one more question. It's a two-part. This has to be more just cost. Um, you talked about cost of materials, and then I heard the word potentially, potentially capital outlay. What do we mean by potentially capital outlay compared to capital outlay or general fund? Yeah, of the two items included in that topic, it was the classroom materials. That portion of the cost is about 4000 and I am looking to confirm that we could use that in capital outlay. I say confirm because it's since there isn't a program in Kansas, I can't really ask our KSDE folks. I'm looking at Missouri um, to see what they have done and have requested information from them. The other 4800 is furnishings, which would definitely be capital outlay. Thank you. And then last question. I noticed priority four said full pay option. What does that mean when we're talking about free public Montessori? What do you mean by full pay? So, um, for example, we were really referencing those three and four-year-olds. Obviously, if you're kindergarten, you, you don't pay for um, 
uh, education here in, in Lawrence, for particularly those three and four year olds, we get 0.5 funding if you are at risk. And so for someone, I think you saw in some of the thought exchange um, feedback that I'm more to, I may not get in because I'm not at risk. And so we would have to charge families that are not at risk if we have room, um, the 4,800, I think that's what it is. Thank you. That is currently our practice at our preschool, in our preschool classrooms at Kennedy, correct? If you are charging families. If but you, we, yeah, that, we don't charge. That we. Oh, get the 0.5 at risk funding? That we charge the families who are, who are not the at risk funded families. I'm not sure. Are we charging any families at Kennedy? No. I don't think we are. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are charging? Yes. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And, and did you say 4,800 for the entire year? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's in comparison to anywhere between thirteen and fifteen thousand. Three and four year old. For um, that's paid Montessori. At, at Kennedy, wow. we we that's pay uh, our peer models for some of our oh, special the peer models, but not our at risk programs. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. That's pretty. Any other questions from the board, Paula? This is not really a question, but just more a couple of comments that are coming to mind. Um, one, um, thinking about any of the policy implications that we may need to consider when we're thinking of this transition to the Montessori. So uh, I support the, the philosophy and, and the way that we're moving, but I don't know if that's something I could do tonight to support that move right now unless we talk and look at the policies and see if we are maybe bypassing anything that we have. Um, in, in our district. And the second thing that comes to mind is a cultural relevant training um, for the staff that will be participating um, to meet uh, student needs and the diversity of our students in our district. Um, those are the couple, few things that have been going through my head and any potential um, unintended consequences of making the shift in the state that we're in right now, considering the budget cuts and staffing, and also considering negotiations um, with uh, LEA and paraeducators union, how much um, of their time are gonna be pulled into the Montessori and supporting that program. Okay. Other, yeah, you do. Okay. Um, we have patron commentary, so but go ahead. Okay. Um, the uh, when you talked, there are a couple th building a little bit on what um, Paula said, but uh, slightly different. Um, with the budget, the implications for the budget are pretty significant. So thinking about our our goals around wages and increases for wages, it's an it, it's a challenging time to when you add up the cost of getting where we need to go over the course of even just these initial couple of years. I'm assuming that is money then we cannot spend on increases for wages. There isn't a dish, there, we're not using ESSER funds for, for I mean, I, I had, we had talked initially about is there a way for us to use some of the funding that we have around COVID for the next, for the initial trainings. I'm not missing anything, correct? We are, we are talking about if we do the funding, that all comes out of general funds. Which, you, you're talking about the, go back to that training slide. So that bottom piece would be the one that would potentially come out of um, general funds. So for the first year of, Mon for the first two years of Montessori, what would the cost be to the district? If we went with the training, our current teachers, because we might come up shy of finding um, certified teachers. So if we did two teachers, if we did two teachers per year, it would be that what two sixty? Okay, and that's there's no other cost that we're talking about besides that. That would be every year of investment would be the two sixty and ongoing any training that we might need to do for retention. Yeah, and in that example, that's considering if we train two teachers per year. Okay. Uh, the other funds are coming out of either capital or the uh, Lawrence Schools Foundation. Okay, um, and then. Um, I'm asking uh, around mental health services. We had some questions around whether that looks different um, in, a, in a Montessori model. In New York Elementary, it's been important that we have good, strong mental health um, support in, in um, well, my community. Um, so I'm just double checking that we won't see any um, reduction in services for mental health supports. We'll still have, a, is there a guidance counselor, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yes, all of it. Okay. Yeah, all of those 
regular supports that students have will still be in place in a Montessori environment. Okay, I have another quick question and then I'll be done. Let me just add one piece to that. Yeah. The social emotional piece is incorporated, incorporated into that Montessori method. Yeah, correct, it should be incorporated in, in our other services as well. Right. I'm talking about the additional services that are provided within the New York Elementary, okay, thank you. And then finally, and this is my last question, Erica. Um, the the um, three to four year olds, when we talked about limiting trans, we don't have any after school programming for them and we're trying to work on um, maintaining or increasing our at risk students as much as possible to be the, the folks that are, are getting this opportunity. If I am a parent um, of a, um, and my family is low income, uh, that after school care is vital to my ability to participate in this program. So I'm wondering about what the solution will be there so that it becomes uh, manageable for parents, particularly single parents, um, to participate fully in this program, knowing that's really who's in in the neighborhood immediate. So I'm wondering about transportation to different, um, you know, uh, daycares, et cetera, so that we, I'm just wondering, has there been any problem solving around this? Because that seems to me like it would be a, a, a significant limitation for a good number of families. Yes, and that's what um, was in this book that we've been been reading here that they talked about providing those um, after school care for the three and three and four year olds and and or transportation. Um, the issue comes down to licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, our boys and girls clubs are if we use them are not licensed for three and four year olds. Mm -hmm. What we did in Kansas City and it was a partnership with um, another organization. Um, so for example, the the mascot was dragons. So we had, had what we call little dragons, and it was mm -hmm. just for the three and four year olds. So we would have to seek out some partnerships. First of all, make sure that we're licensed, um, whether we go to an outside organization or maybe we can have some extended conversations with boys and girls clubs to see what that licensing piece would look like for after school care. Because we do know that is critical. If the the, the beauty of this is that we're able to start some three and four year olds educational career early. However, if mom is at work and can't leave at three. Okay you know, do I just keep them at grandma's house? Mm -hmm. You know, so is that, that defeating the purpose? And so that's something that we'll need to problem solve. And I would just kind of throw in there when you're thinking about partnerships, I, I would just also kind of just note that we, our college and career center, we have an early education licensing program. So that is a, another place that we can kind of be thinking about. So just throwing it out there. Okay. And there's not anything we need to do to New York Elementary in terms of capital outlay costs to make it ready for early childhood education, as we had done with um, Kennedy a few years ago to get it ready. Because your two kindergarten classes have um, they are, they have, they have restrooms in them. And the, the thing is, since we have the five-year-olds in there, we are public school, we are not held to some of the uh, licensing regulations, okay. according to Esther. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I was trying to summarize the concerns. I know we've heard a lot of what we love about this program. So one, um, Kelly, to your point, seeking out some after-school support for the families that have three to four-year-olds. Um, I get that, being a former single mom, that would be a significant challenge. Um, Paula, you mentioned some um, policy concerns. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, like, top of mind or something you need to dig into? Nothing. Nothing that comes to mind immediately. I would have to go through and identify what policies, that, if any, exist to transition to a monastery. I would I have to I look think at... It's policy ICA. <laughs> ICA, yeah. Uh, that I, that I think would apply to this. Obviously, I would depend on the policy experts. Yeah. Here, yeah. When we were pulling them, when I was pulling them, um, the new teaching method is what this would be considered. Uh, it's research-based teaching strategies and techniques are permitted with approval of the superintendent. So that was what I found in ICA instructional program development. Is that what you were thinking, Paula? Is there another one, that, Shannon, that you know of? No, actually, I was going to say, I, I, just without taking a closer look at it, Paula, and I, this is not meant to be dismissive of your concerns, there's not anything that is immediately jumping to my mind that we've ever looked at in policy committee that would make me say, whoa, we have to change policy in order to be able to adopt. Because the, the, the general tenor of the policies around instructional programs is that um, the board and administration has flexibility to adopt. Um, right, no, yeah, yeah I understand yeah, that, so, I've seen that, yeah. 
So I, so I, as after you said that, I was sitting here trying to think if there was anything that came to mind immediately. And um, if anything, um, that we might want to look at what might be around our policies related to the pre-K piece of it. But even at that, I think our, we have a lot of flexibility in our existing policy structure. So I, I'm, that's not something I'm, I'm super worried about. Um, I would just kind of add. Sure. Sorry about that. I would add to that just from a policy perspective that a lot of our policies are really umbrella, mm -hmm. um, and the 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 practices and procedures that follow it within GAP are probably going to need to be amended. So I imagine there will be policy considerations we haven't considered about as there are any time we take on a new initiative. And then you know you and Shannon and I, with the help of Kristen and who, because I'm thinking there might be staffing issues we're not thinking about in terms of. Um, policies that are unrelated to uh, what they're talking about as well but yeah oh I, yeah no I think it's a great idea I think it's the philo I, I, I'm just worried and anticipating some of the challenges that we'll be having and that we're facing currently mm -hmm. that might be felt when we make that transition into this um, monastery yeah. mm -hmm. I agree okay. Erica so one policy that might be implicated, for example, or not be implicated, but actually gives us flexibility, oh, we have a policy AC on school district organization that says the district will be organized on a K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12 basis, but then it also says the board may also establish special unit schools such as continuing education, alternative schools, summer schools, or other configurations as it deems appropriate to meet the goals of the district. So if the board adopts Montessori as being appropriate to meet the goals of the district, then we've, we've met the the terms of that particular board policy. So that would be an example of where yeah. a lot of flexibility written into yeah, existing I, policy. No, I, I appreciate you pulling that out. I think some of the things I was looking at was like a charter. I mean, so yeah, thanks for pulling that out, Shannon, yeah. making that. Yeah, because this wouldn't be organized. This wouldn't fall under that chart, the charter school provision, because we're not um, adopting a charter for an independently run. Um, yeah, so I see why you'd have that question. Yeah. Okay, we are going to transition to public comment. Barry Shalinsky. Hello, uh, my name is Barry Shalinsky. I am a member of the New York Elementary Site Council, and I'm president of the East Lawrence Neighborhood Association. Uh, I'd like to just quickly reference a letter that you received from uh, Catherine and Caleb Morse. Um, Caleb is the uh, chair of our site council, and I would just say briefly that um, I largely agree with most of the points that are made in that letter, so I don't need to uh, repeat any of it. East Lawrence Neighborhood Association is on record as supporting New York School remaining open as a neighborhood school serving the families in East Lawrence and Brook Creek neighborhoods. This plan accomplishes that goal. I like that. <laughs> I also like that this plan appears to be well thought out. That's not to say that there aren't plenty of details, but for the amount of time that people have been working on this, um, it's really pretty amazing how well thought out it is. Uh, I like that all of the right experts are being consulted and that we are really, really lucky to have so many resources in our community or close by. And most of all, I like that the staff within the building is being empowered to take leadership and ownership. 
um, that is really, really important. What I do not like is that families choosing traditional learning model, uh, that their option is cordly. For many families, particularly people that might commute to uh, Topeka or Kansas City, Woodlawn and Pinckney would be much more convenient. It's on their way. Um, apart from all of this, it, it appears, I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but I'm saying it appears that um, certain schools are being set up to have a lower population, and we really, really need to have a district-wide comprehensive boundary study of all schools to inform our decisions going forward. And finally, I think that we should examine STEAM, uh, language immersion, uh, international baccalaureate, and other learning models as a creative way of attracting people to some of our low enrollment schools. Thank you so much for your comments. We appreciate it. Okay, so in our there's a motion. Um, Do you have a question? Yes. So um, I have, based off of our comments this evening, um, have a uh, just a slightly revised uh, monetary motion to let let's consider. I guess you can talk us through your revised motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, so one of the things that we um, had uh, talked about is um, that there may be additional um, priorities um, on East uh, neighborhoods um, to add to the priority list before opening the enrollment to the full district boundaries. Another thing that we talked about, um, or that I heard was a concern, is uh, the district being able to seek out um, partnerships to provide aftercare for students who are three and four year olds. Um, and then finally, the, the third thing was um, that New York families um, are allowed to, to, to be able to opt into their preferred school of attendance um, if capacity allows. And so um, that is the only uh, revisement uh, to the motion is taking into consideration those three things that we talked about this evening. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and read the motion to see if there's a second um, on the motion as stated in the board docs. Okay. And then if it fails, we can talk about an amendment. Do you have a question, Kelly? Yeah, a process question. So I, I um, wondered if this natural step kind of, because there's some of the things that um, Kay has mentioned that I have concerns about, but it seems like you, you still need to vote to approve it. And then the questions like around, are we going to fund um, te new teachers' positions internally? Are we going to direct the district to look at other options to address some of the areas. Does it seem as though we could, that we, after we make this motion, there's still going to be direction from the board, right? Okay, I just wanted to double check that. Okay. That's kind of how I was interpreting some of That's Okay. I, this, yeah. is Carol, I, this is how I say the board, the board further directs, so. Yeah. I'll, I'll make the, um, the motion in board docs and see, see if there's a second for it. I move that the Board of Education approve the addition of the Montessori School Philosophy and Curriculum at New York Elementary, beginning with the Children's House, serving ages three, four, and kindergarten for the 2022-2023 school year. The Board further directs the district administration to determine the phased addition of other grade levels during subsequent years. 
Do we have a second to that motion? I'll second it. Kadu Blackwood? No. Emerson? No. Jones? Yes. Nussbaum? No. Smith? Yes. Hill? Yes. Kimball? Yes. Motion passes 4-3. Shannon. I actually wanted to take a moment before we adjourn the meeting to just share something that was shared with me uh, while we were having our discussion this evening. So we have recognized students um, from the Free State High School debate program at our meetings. Um, did you get a text about it? Um, and I just wanted to share that we have a debate duo from Free State High School, John Marshall and Serena Rupp, who are current, who are maybe they're done now, but they were a shortly, short time ago, debating for a national championship at, and of course my screen just went dark, so now I have to log back in. Do you have it pulled up? University of Kentucky Tournament of Champions. It's the Tournament of Champions, and they would, they are the only, the second Kansas team ever to make, um, to make the finals. Wow. So congratulations to them. No matter how their final round turns out, that is really, really amazing and impressive. So. Um, wow. I was pretty excited when I yeah. saw that pop up on my screen. I had to share. Um, that's awesome. Uh, and not to take away from that, I would like to talk, because uh, we had talked about the motion passing so that we could start the Montessori. I do want to ask the question around, because the district has to start hiring for some of these positions, around the board's direction for current teachers to be um, supported in their training. Is that something you need direction from the board for tonight? Or is that something that because there is a budget implication there. So even if you have the direction to administer, you don't have the, the, you still have to get approval from the board around that particular issue and the timeline is tight. So yeah. do you need something tonight in order to go forward with your hiring decisions? Yes, on that one slide with the, um, that will pay the salary. We mm -hmm. need direction from the board. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yes. You, you're gonna need a motion on that. Mm -hmm. okay. Just some, direct, some direction. And it's between option one and option two, mm -hmm. right? Or a combination of. Or a combination of either one. Kelly, you brought this up. Any strong feelings either way <coughs> on which option or um, option? I, so for me, I don't, um, I could see, and I think I'm right about this, but maybe um, this is a question for you two, finally. You've stayed all night. Thank you for coming. The question I have is, it seems like quite possible that we can recruit the teachers at the early level that are certified and ready to get into the classroom. The problem is going to come when we get to the first and the second grade level. So to me, because I, I would imagine there is a issue with the number of um, teachers available, I, I can't imagine that we're not going to have to, to pay for the training at some point. Mm -hmm. Does that seem realistic? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So we would just, be able to support our current teachers in the, applying for those positions. And just to be clear, we, we feel very confident we have teachers to start us off next year, trained teachers to okay. start us off. That's what I thought. Yeah. We need to get that pipeline going. Right. Also. Kelly, um, we're over here debating about whether this is something that requires a motion. Um, so I, my thought would be that that no, not yet. Well, if the train if they have to apply if the training starts, when is the date? Well, the information informational meeting is May May fifth, oh. and the training starts in September. Okay, so it's we, just we the need to reserve our seats. Okay, no, do we right. do we have to reserve our seats for the that particular? When do we have to, what's the timeline? Yeah, I will know, we will know more on that timeline in terms of when we need to reserve our seats at that May 4th meeting. Okay, May so it meeting. can wait until the May 9th. We can bring something back. And we can come board. with a prepared motion for, okay. okay, does that make sense? Yeah, you already knew that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we can bring it. Okay, thank you for. Because looking at the numbers, to me, my initial 
thought was it makes sense to work as hard as we can to recruit the people who already have the Montessori training mm -hmm. and then get them their even you know get them their Kansas license if we're recruiting people from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with Kelly. At some point, we're not going to be able to recruit that person that we need, and so. Um, and that is an area where I would have additional questions for, yeah. for follow-up. And like I said, we have a couple of teachers that are ready to go. To that. that are ready to go, but we don't have like um, endorsements for Montessori. We don't have a lot of teachers that are ready at the first grade, second grade level to do that. No, saying some teachers that are ready to go to training. Okay, so yeah. that would be a May 9th yes. conversation. And okay. let, me, let me catch her before she leaves. Lindsay is leaving. I want to thank Lindsay publicly for going on the tour with us to uh, Holiday Montessori. So thank you, Lindsay. And how long is the training? Uh, Sep September to June. September to June, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other announcements? Um, the, uh, we indicated our partners at Raintree. They have invited New York families or any other families that would like a tour to see a firsthand. Uh, they will welcome board members as well. Also, Holiday, Dr. Um, um, Ms. Bass Barlow has invited board members to come and see a public Montessori there. Um, and. Uh, it's not, I think maybe this could be to one of your, maybe somebody's point, I can't remember. It's not Montessori and nothing else, it's Montessori and something else. Because so we'll um, begin working on a survey that we'll survey the community to see what other offerings would this community want to see in some of our um, buildings. Yeah. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. All right, and a second. <laughs> All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried.